from India. He is a chairman, Department of Ophthalmology at Sir Gangaram Hospital and Vision Eye Centers, New Delhi. He is president of Ophthalmology Society of South Asia, chairman of Specialty Education of International Council of Ophthalmology, and counselor at large of Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. He also served as former president of Asia Pacific Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, Ophthalmic Association of India, and All India Ophthalmological Society. Professor Gober has received numerous prestigious awards, including the Distinguished Service Award from Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, Honorary FRCS, Honorary FICO, and numerous uh, national and international orations has been delivered by him. We are very glad to have you here today, sir. Uh, likewise, I would like to introduce our next panelist, Dr. Natavot Wanamkar from Thailand. He is the Assistant Chairperson Director of Ophthalmic Fellowship Program, Department of Ophthalmology, Bumbrungkar International Hospital, Bangkok, Thailand. He was former Program Director of Residency Training Program and Director of Ophthalmic Fellowship Program at Meta Pracharak Eye Institute, Medical Services, Ministry of Public Health from the year 2004 to 2008. He is also Director of Ad Eye Clinic. Dr. Natawood has received numerous prestigious awards, including Outstanding Doctor Award from Medical Services, Ministry of Public Health, Thailand in the year 2012, and achieved uh, a Power Achievement Award in the year 2017. He has given several lectures in both national as well as international platform, and has several books published and more than 50 scientific research publications in internationally peer-reviewed journal. We are very honored to have you here today, Dr. Natawood. Likewise, our next panelist is Professor Dr. Rohit Saiju. He is a Director of Hospital Services and Head of Department of Orbit and Ophthalmology Department, Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology. He is also manage, Managing Director of Drishti the Vision Eye Center in Kathmandu. He is current President of Nepal Ophthalmic Society and Founder President of Nepalese Society of Ophthalmic Surgeon. He is also Vice President of Ophthalmic Society of South Asia and served as a former Vice President of Asia Pacific Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Professor Saizu has received numerous distinguished awards, including APAO Distinguished Service Award from the APAO in the year 2014 in Tokyo. He is international master trainer for cataract, orbit, and oculoplasty, and has trained several eye specialists from Nepal as well as abroad. And Professor Sesu has 36 scientific research publications and over 50 presentations in various conferences in Nepal and abroad. We are very glad to have you here today, sir. Likewise, our next panelist is Dr. Ben Lingu, who is assistant professor and consultant cataract and oculoplastic surgeon in. Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology. He is current president of Nepalese Society of Ophthalmic Surgeon, Scientific Secretary of Ophthalmic Society of South Asia, Chief Executive Officer of Global Eye Center Private Limited, and co founder and executive director of Working Vision USA. He is active life member of several national as well as international ophthalmological society. He has trained more than 50 eye specialists from Nepal and abroad and has volunteered in various international eye surgical camps in international arena as well. Dr. Bain has two medical books published, 24 scientific research publications, and more than 100 scientific presentations at national and international conferences. Dr. Bain has also received several awards, including Prodigious Sark Academy of Ophthalmology Oration in Subspeciality for Young Ophthalmologist Award in the year 2018. We are very delighted and honored to have him here today, sir. Likewise, our next panelist is Dr. Sulakshmi Kartwal, who is Chief Medical Director of Eye Health Program, Rapti and Badurgans since the year 2007. She is current Vice President of Nepalese Society of Ophthalmic Surgeon and Life Member of Nepal, Nepal Ophthalmic Society, Nepalese Society of Ophthalmic Surgeon. And she served as an active member participant in RAP survey in 2010 and has used experience of conducting various surgical eye camps in remote areas of Nepal. And Dr. Kotwal has also received several uh, national and international uh, awards, including Nitro Jyoti Dr. Nicole Grasset Award in the year 2015 and Professor R.P. Pokhrel NNJ's Indo-Nepal Friendship Award in the year 2017. We are very honored to have you here today, ma'am. And uh, without wasting much time, I would like to request my colleague, Dr. Nisa, to proceed with uh, our next session, that is uh, scientific session. Thank you, Dr. Serbin. Uh, we are very honored to have here with us our 
um, distinguished panelists. So now uh, we now move on to the scientific session. So before we start our uh, talk, I would like to request our esteemed st uh, speakers to limit the talk uh, time within the provided time. And if there are any questions to the speaker, I request you all to post it in chat, chat box. So now with this, um, we move on to our um, uh, to uh, talking session. So uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nathau to tell us about endoscopic Indonesia DCR. As earlier said, Dr. Nathau is a plastic and reconstructive specialist, and he is an assistant chairperson and director of Oculoplastic Fellowship Program in Bumungrat International Hospital, Thailand. He is also a director of ATI Clinic. Dr. Nathau, the screen is yours. Hello, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so um, glad to have the opportunity to uh, share my concept for the endoscopic DCR uh, today. And today I would like to share about the two concepts for uh, uh, approach that I have used for my endoscopic DCR. The first one is the bony concept and uh, for the, how to get the adequacy of the bony ostium. And second is a flap concept that I have applied and used for the flap design and uh, try to approximation with the suturing technique. Okay, this is the uh, good video show the three dimension of the normal and the ideal bony ostium on the right hand side. And if you uh, have used a uh, Apple, you can use a uh, download the anatomy C application and try to learn the relationship of the important bone. Now the four of the important bone that we need to uh, be familiar and, uh, 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 and the understanding. The first one is the frontal process of the maxillary bone. We need to do, uh, know the relationship of the surface anatomy and the surrounding soft tissue surrounding the bone, the nasal lacrimal duct, and uh, the thickness of the frontal process of the maxillary bone. Second is the lacrimal bone, especially on the anterior half of the uh, lacrimal bone. And the third one is the uh, ethmoid bone, especially the medial aspect of the lacrimal uh, drainage unit. And especially sometimes occasionally we have to deal with the inferior conga bone. That is the uh, drainage pathway by the distal part. If we know the relationship very good between the soft tissue and the bony tissue, we can deal very good during the operation. If you are the beginner, you can buy the application and you can try to do the endoscope, digital endoscopic dissection. First, removal on the lower two third and upper one third, and then try to remove the lacrimal bone and then try to evaluate how good you have done by the uh, orbital wheel. And sometimes you have to deal with the active cell or the unsinate process uh, medially. So let's uh, go to the real uh, surgical uh, video. First one, we start to remove the C-shaped flap and try to remove the lower two third with the simple correction longer. In my practice, I, I, I don't use a drill. I use a simple longer because it's cheap and fast and try to remove the nasal mucosa conservatively and remove the bone uh, in the uh, to get the adequate nasal ostium. At this, uh, at this step, try not to remove the nasal mucosa too much because we don't have to leave the bare bone and lead the, that gonna leading to the secondary intention healing. The next step, we deal with the upper one third of the frontal process of the max three bone. This is a more challenging because sometimes if the nasal cavity is big enough, it's easy. But if the nasal cavity is so narrow from the uh, septal deviation, sometimes we have the difficult time because the space is limited. And the one of the trick that to remove the bone, we should remove about three to five millimeter above the common that canaliculi. This is uh, the, 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 the point that uh, we can get the adequacy of the bone that we have removed. The next concept 
that I always use to apply to doing the operation. If we have uh, the concept in mind that how uh, many type of the classification that we can use, uh, we can uh, adjust and choose the appropriate. In my practice, I have started to use uh, flap suturing since 2006. And nowadays I have the, in 100% of my case, I try to remove. And the ideal suturing and the ideal suture material is a COYQ. On the upper uh, part is a S22 uh, needle is a ideal uh, needle because it's a spatula needle and the, the, the length of the needle is a eight millimeter and the curve is a 180 degree. If you don't have the S22 and if you have only S14 or uh, uh, the 90 degree needle, you can use uh, uh, your uh, 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 needle holder uh, to bend from 190 degree to be the 180 degree because the 180 degree can uh, work uh, really good in the really narrow, really narrow cavity. For the flap suturing classification, I try to divide to be four classification and I will start the step by step. The first one, the most common one that I always use and most of my case about 95% plus, I have used uh, anterior and the posterior flap. This is a diagram show that when we have removed the nasal mucosa and the bone in the adequate bony anatomy, we make the eye-shaped incision to create the anterior and the posterior flap. And in the video, you can see that I try to suture the upper, upper, upper half of the anterior flap and try to use a two-hand technique with my assistant uh, sit in the opposite side and hold the uh, endoscope. The technique to hold the endoscope, we should locate the endoscope in the inflow medial uh, of the part of the nasal cavity that allow the surgeon to have the adequate space to work and you can use, the surgeon can use a two-hand technique and try to uh, introduce the notch gradually from the outside to inside. And from the video, if you have time and you want to make sure that the flap is so good, you can try to make the posterior flap suturing. But anterior flap suturing is much more easier because uh, uh, more space and you can work but the posterior are more challenging because of the a little bit too deeper and uh, sometimes we have no adequate of the nasal mucosa posteriorly but in my practice uh, most of the time more than 95 percent i do only the anterior flap surgery the second classification is a uh, superior and the inferior flap in this flap uh, that be uh, can be applied uh, but I use only three to five percent of the, my practice, and the the lacrimal sac that get the distended from the chronic dacheocystitis or acute dacheocystitis, we can we can use this technique to apply. But uh, in some difficult condition, I use a superior flap to uh, optimize the surgical success. And on the left-hand side, you can see that we can create the head-shaped incision. And from the video, uh, on the inferior flap can be sutured also, but most of the time, the inferior flap can uh, drop it by the gravity. And the third one, the third one is a combined flap. This is a combination between the uh, superior and the anterior flap. And this technique, I, uh, most of the time I use for the, uh, when I do the revision surgery, I cannot show you. And lastly, the isolated flap. This is a good uh, uh, video uh, that show the step of the <clears throat> mechanism of the sun syndrome that I think I have um, seen uh, this one. Let me show you by the video. And this is a, a, a picture of the, uh, when the surgeon removed too much of the nasal mucosa and the bony part uh, have opened in the small um, uh, uh, opening. And one, when you put the stand and keep for a while, the scar tissue encroaching from the upper part and the lower part, like, uh, 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 and then when we, and even though we put the silicone stand after remove the stand, 
the starchy chew come out. And sometimes they have the small opening we call the sum syndrome. But sometimes the starchy chew uh, cover for the whole part and they have the thick starchy chew. In this case, we can apply the isolated fat for correcting the sum syndrome. And okay. And this is a video that show the pain that have on the right side and have the really tiny opening. When we try to irrigate that and the water could be flow, but the patient have the symptom that a lot of excessive tear. When we do the uh, evaluation, when we make the vertical cut, you can see that the internal mucosa is still healthy. In this case, we can try to apply the anterior flap or apply the posterior flap with this one simple uh, isolated flap. Sometimes we can manage this one in the office. We have no need to bring the patient to the operation room. If you have the endoscope in your office, you can just the patient lie down, inject some numbing medication, and use a tiny uh, uh, 15 uh, blade and make a vertical cut. And then with the one simple suturing, we can correct this one easier. But we need to make sure that the internal lacrimal mucosa is so healthy. Uh, the next one I'm gonna show the uh, the how the inadequate bony osteum lead to the failed DCR and uh, how we are uh, approached by the endoscopically. This is a video show uh, how to if the surgeon do the external DCR and when we perform the external DCR, sometimes we can remove the bone in the limited limited area and the uh, area of the bone removed underneath the middle cantal ligament, ligament gonna be quite difficult. If we use an endoscope to examine internationally, we can see that sometimes they have the limited space. And the, on the left-hand side, show the diagram that show the fell from the endoscopic DCR. And you can see on the red area that they have the really thick scar tissue, mostly on the nasal side. That because of the endoscopic approach that removed the nasal mucosa too much. On the right-hand side, you can see the scar tissue a lot on the uh, uh, nas uh, on the lacrimal side. By the... Uh, uh, step of the scar tissue that uh, previously I have tried to uh, think about the mechanism when the we put uh, the the uh, silicone stand and when we remove the stand the scar tissue encroaching to be the thick scar tissue and then completely uh, obstruction happen and sometimes the really thick scar tissue happen and uh, the uh, sometimes the nasal mucosa have been disturbed so much on the lacrimal uh, mucosa, sometimes it leading to the very thick scar tissue, including the common canalicular area. In this condition, it's gonna be quite tough when we try to, when you, we try to uh, revision this one. By the endoscopic uh, benefit, we can use the endoscope and try to remove the upper one third of the bone. If in this case, we try to expose to the whole uh, uh, wheel of the uh, uh, medial side of the lacrimal uh, uh, drainage system. In this video show on the left-hand side, the patient that have the when it uh, fell from the previous uh, endoscope uh, 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 DCR surgery. And when we make the C-shaped flap, it's not like, not, uh, not that easy. We can see the really thick scar tissue. And in this case, we have found that the upper one third of the uh, uh, frontal process of the uh, maxillary bone have not been removed properly. So we can remove uh, 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 step by step by the chisel and the mallet. And this uh, step, after removal of the one, upper one third, we have seen that on the area of the common canaliculi, they have the really, really thick scar. In this step, I try to make the horizontal cut and try to use a second instrument, try to create the, and try to, even though you have the limited area of the lysidome mucosa, sometimes the scar tissue, we can make the uh, vertical cut or the horizontal cut and try to make the scar tissue imitate like a pseudo flap. And in this case, I try to make the scar tissue imitate like a superior flap. 
and try to use a, a backhand uh, suturing and try to make the suturing to the superior pseudo flap to the uh, nasal mucosa uh, superiorly. And in this case, if we try to, if we don't do the suturing, sometimes the scar tissue that uh, like the superior flap can be uh, uh, flipped uh, inferiorly and can make the uh, scar tissue, uh, will it recurring of the sick scar tissue on the area of the common can canaliculi. In this case, I think the benefit from the apply on the superior flap suturing can help in the difficult condition and then put the silicone stand and put the MMC or put the, uh, uh, the steroid injection gonna help. By conclusion, if we have the two concepts by the bone concept and the flap concept, we can make, keep in mind and we can uh, uh, choose uh, the, any type of the uh, classification to apply for any kind of the endoscopic surgery. Thank you. Yeah, I'm here. It was muted. Sorry. So thank you, Dr. Nathar, uh, for sharing your experiences. Uh, yeah, it, it was a wonderful and uh, interesting talk. And I would now like to request Professor Dr. Havati to add few comments on this presentation. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here uh, to this webinar. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate Nathar Wood uh, for that outstanding presentation. You know, um, I remember when I was doing uh, endoscopic radio frequency assisted DCR, I also don't use the, uh, you know, these drills and then, uh, you know, the powered instrumentation, especially now uh, in these COVID times, wherein uh, it's very easy to produce aerosolization of these uh, viruses. And I've seen in your, uh, you know, in your presentation that you also utilize the, uh, Kerosene punch just to remove the uh, anterior one third of the frontal process of the maxilla. And I also admire your technique of suturing the, uh, you know, the flaps. Very, uh, actually very few surgeons can do that. But with your uh, technique and of course, using the uh, proper needles and, uh, you know, and everything, including the suturing forceps, uh, you, are, you were able to do so. Now my comment is, uh, uh, the one thing that I find difficulty in uh, endonasal DCR is, of course, in cases of uh, cicatrice, lacrimal sac, and of course, patients uh, who have, uh, you know, what we call a septal deviation, wherein you really have to do uh, septoplasty before the procedure. Now, um, we know very well that uh, the, you know, the success whether you are doing intranasal or endonasal or whether you are doing external DCR, uh, it is the wide marsupialization of the lacrimal sac plus a large bony ostium, which are the keys to, uh, you know, to a successful uh, outcome. And uh, the problem is if you have a cicatrice uh, lacrimal sac, the problem is you cannot suture it and as such, it will be really very difficult uh, because you cannot you, well, you can produce a wide marsupialization, but unfortunately you cannot suture the flap because uh, you have only a very minimal small amount of posterior flap. Uh, I've seen uh, you know, other surgeons, what they do is they try to, uh, you know, to uh, fix the flap with a fibrin glue and uh, in order to, you know, uh, to produce a, uh, that, uh, uh, intranasal ostium, which will not close. And then of course, um, a large bony ostium, uh, which you are able to address just with the use of your, uh, you know, kerosene punch. And then, uh, so those are my concern. I mean, uh, may I ask you how much is your success rate when it comes to dealing with uh, cicatrice flaps or let's say contracted sac? 
Um, Dr. Hawate, when they have the very thick scar tissue, um, in, in the first 10 years of my practice, I had a lot of fell uh, because I did not realize that um, how big the nasal ostium I, I should get. And second, uh, sometime in the beginning of my practice, I did not try to make the very well um, um, approximation of the flap. So in the first part of my practice, I have about 10% of the fell. But when I try to introduce the concept of the bone and the concept of the uh, flap in the past uh, eight year, I haven't seen my 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 fell case. But, and one one case that I did the with the good bone and I did really good surgery. And the patient is an international patient. He came from the Africa and get the surgery with me, and he came back by. Uh, two weeks after the surgery, and he came back again by six months. But in that case, is one case that I got the failure from 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 the from my surgery because that because of uh, no good post-operative follow-up and no good for the cleaning of the nasal cavity. And when I have found that they have the chronic infection in in the like annulation with the bacteria when he came back at six months and that initiate the cicatricial encroaching to the ocean that we have done very good during even though we have done very good job during the operation i think the the the, the part of the follow-up is so important also because if we do the good job but we did not follow up patient properly sometimes it only minimal the uh, the the nasal quad or nasal discharge can it initiate the fungus or the bacterial infection that gonna lead to the, the abnormal scar tissue. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. So really, it's uh, you know follow up is also very important, uh, much more so if you are doing uh, recanalization procedures. Uh, but of course, uh, I think really the uh, the clue uh, to success, you no, know, because. Uh, we are aware of the paradox of lacrimal surgery, which was published by uh, Geoffrey Rose, wherein there is a backwash uh, of the of the uh, secretion, even if there is a patent, you know, intranasal ostium. Nevertheless, uh, I think it's really the elimination of the sac, elimination of the sac, wide marsupialization, whether you use a fibrin glue or a, you suture it, that will, uh, you know. Uh, uh, be the success uh, or will uh, dictate the success of the procedure. Uh, and of course, uh, you've mentioned about the large bony ostium, so you avoid some syndrome. So, but again, uh, I would like to congratulate you because your technique of suturing is really uh, in, uh, very impressive. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I would like to uh, take a question from one of our participants. Uh, you know, he, he mentioned about this, uh, uh, I'm trying to, yeah. Uh, it says here, uh, Dr. Natabud, nice to hear from you again. Right, could you sir. Share, could you share the name, name of application about study of the bones in endoscopic DCR you are showing? The, the name of the application? The name of the application, right? The name of the application, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, the, the, you can download in the Apple store. It's named Anatomy C. And you, we, we can buy uh, like uh, annually uh, uh, for per year. They have the like a student uh, version, a professional version, and advanced version. And you can use in the any, any iPad. If you have iPad, you can open and use this one to show the patient. And I think you can record it that one and you can apply this one for uh, your talk and you can uh, let the resident keep practice and do the surgery, even though it's gonna be eyelid surgery, uh, external DCR, endonasal, or even though orbital surgery by digital dissection. I think it's very, very helpful for learning. No, thank you very much. That was fantastic. May, may I ask a question to Dr. Natabert? Sir, yes, please. Nice to meet you, sir, Dr. Kovar. First of all, admiration for the quality of your surgery. I've hardly seen anybody do a biomanual procedure in the nose so beautifully and do such wonderful suturing. 
enjoyed watching you some three decades ago when you came for a, one of our earliest oculoplastic meetings and showed the flaps so beautifully. My okay. question was, was, are there situations where you prefer to do an external DCR rather than an endonasal DCR? Say, for example, a traumatic nasolacrimal duct obstruction with uh, um, a lot of bony uh, deformity as well. Or pediatric cases, or how do you um, prefer to do them? Oh, um, um, honestly, for the past um, 16 years, I have never done the external DCR anymore. I, I try to keep our... Uh, use the uh, endoscopic in every case of my uh, DCR surgery. Even though I have the difficult time for the uh, marked septal deviation, I have the technique that I used to, I, I did not do the, the septal deviation surgery. I just uh, put the, use the fear to put the septal uh, that deviated away. And sometimes I use a cotton chip and cotton ball in the small and put in the uppermost of the nasal cavity, just a few millimeter that I can have the more space that allow me to do the surgery. But that kid, that sometimes they have bleeding a lot. So we just pack it and we pack it and we pack it. That's, a, that's a my, my, my technique. I, I have, I, I got the, uh, try to do 100% of the endoscopic DCR. And I can, I think I can suture, I try to suture in every case. And if I have the traumatic case and have the like a uh, inferior orbital rim or frontal posterior fracture and this treatment, I would ask the patient to do the CT scan first. And in some condition that the bone deviates so much and they have the like displacement of the bone and the frontal posterior displacement and very thick scar tissue happen. I will use a CT to put the, in the application name HOROS, H-O-R-O-S, and you can edit your own in the computer Mac, Macintosh, Apple, uh, and you can like to digital T dimension and you can uh, manually study about the 3D bone. And then uh, I, if you, I, I found that it's so fake, I would use the retinal light pipe to put from the punctum to see and locate the area of the thick bone. And I would try to do to remove the thick bone as much as possible. That's my technique. And, and I, 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 I I, I never done uh, the external DCR for at all. And last question for the pediatric DCR, I will wait the patient until at least uh, three years old to have the nasal cavity big enough and the head is big enough. And then I start to do the endoscopic DCR in the kid that more than three years old. Two years old may be too small. I may try to uh, do the stand and, and uh, topping and restand. Oh, don't Thank root you. out. I have a comment that you have once again proven that you are fantastic endoscopic dactyl surgeon of the region. And I got the opportunity to learn from Dr. Nutout in 2008, endoscopic DCR, and bring the endoscopic DCR technique in Nepal. And since then, we have practicing that and spreading uh, among our colleagues here. And I remember that instead of doing the septoplasty, you used to do septal fracture with the fear, just push forcefully the septum to the another side and make a space. And it is a good technique and, and you can do that for several times if disturbing your space at the time. My question to you that in the scar tissue management, what is the experience of mitomycin C using to manage the scar tissue to make the successful DCR during your division? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, that's a good question. On, on the beginning of my practice around 2006, 7, 8, I have the, some complication from the, from the uh, scar tissue. And that moment I have tried the metosensin C for a while, but my concept of the bone and the flap not that, not that, uh, not that good yet. So even though I have tried to uh, use a mitomycin C. I have found that some care, I still got the uh, failure from, even though I tried to use a very good mitomycin C. So after 2008 or nine, I stopped using mitomycin C at all. And personally, I, I do believe about the 
uh, successful of the anatomical success more than the chemical uh, agent. So, and, and in some condition that the patient have the really bad scar tissue in the common canaliculi, I, I use some mitomycin C also, but uh, if you use uh, mitomycin C more than concentration too much, it's gonna be necrosis and, and, and need to be really, really careful. And I think doctor, doc, uh, we will talk this one in, in the fail DCR. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, with the comment of Dr. Grober, I think, uh, you know, uh, I've done, uh, you know, endoscopic DCR for quite a long time. And, uh, you know, at present, I have completely shifted to, uh, you know, transcanalicular. But, you know, at times, uh, I really have to do uh, external. Why do I prefer external over the in, uh, endonasal DCR? Uh, the reason is that, you know, I, I don't like to, to use uh, powered instrumentation such as drills, which uh, actually is very, very helpful when you do endoscopic uh, DCR, uh, because with the use of your uh, kerosene pants, sometimes it takes, uh, you know, a bit difficult to remove that anterior frontal process of the maxilla, which is the anterior one third. So I think, but uh, of course, uh, each of us uh, surgeon has its own, uh, you know, uh, preference uh, and uh, what you have uh, practiced uh, for many, many years. Uh, I think uh, that's the one that, uh, and if you're getting good results, you should stick to it. So, thank you. Thank you, Professor Havati, uh, Professor Grover, Dr. Nathard, and Professor Saizu. Uh, we have had a very nice discussion here. <laughs> so, um, I would like to proceed uh, on to our next presentation. And before that, I would like to uh, uh, have a gentle reminder to all to limit talk to the allotted time. And also I'd like to remind that we have a separate session for panel discussion where we can have a queries discussed. So our next speaker is Dr. Vasantara Sharma. Dr. Sharma is the medical director of Sri Badri Eye Center Nepal, immediate past president of Nessus, former associate professor of National Academy of Medical Sciences, former deputy director of Lumbini Eye Institute Nepal, he is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including Distinguished Service Award of Apao Bali, Indonesia in 2009, and also a recipient of Pikas Ratan Award uh, for Meritorious Services, Outstanding Performance, and Remarkable Role at Indo-Nepal Friendship. I'd like to welcome Dr. Vasantara Sharma, and he'll be talking about non-endoscopic Indonesia this year. Sir, the screen is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we yes, can sir. hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you all for having me here today. And good evening, everybody. Uh, I have been, I've had the privilege of being sandwiched between two giants. So my job has been uh, uh, made easy because most of the critical points uh, in endonasal DCR have been discussed in detail by Dr. Natawood and the panelists. But nevertheless, today I'm here to discuss about non-endoscopic endonasal DCRs. And it says past experiences because, because of my uh, uh, health reasons, I have, I'm unable to do DCR surgery for past one and a half, almost more than a year due to this COVID pandemic. So nevertheless, I'm gonna share my past experiences and hopefully by the end of the, this whole session, more and more young ophthalmologists in Nepal will be encouraged to take up endoscopic endonasal DCR. Now, we started endonasal DCR in 2004 after I had trained under uh, Dr. Dolman in uh, Vancouver. And the reason I started a non-endoscopic endonasal DCR was that I was trained to do non-endoscopic DCR. That's what everybody was doing then at that institute where I trained. And I never had the re I never had the chance, or even I didn't even, never felt the, any reason to change to endoscopic endonasal DCR. So, uh, but never, after 16 years, you know, we still find that endonasal DCR has not picked up in Nepal. Uh, this may be due to a lot of reasons, but one of the primary reasons is that I think young ophthalmologists, surgeons have not have given the training opportunities 
and they are not provided with uh, proper facilities, surgical facilities to do these surgeries. But there's been a change in a lot of the eye institutions now where they have, is from, they have uh, moved from doing high volume cataract surgery to establishing subspeciality practices. So I hope that in future, more and more surgeons will be doing endonasal DCR. Today, I'm gonna to stick my uh, topic to non-endoscopic endonasal DCR. So endonasal DCR means for me, non-endoscopic non mechanical DCRs. So I will skip the anatomy because I think uh, Dr. Natawuta has given an excellent presentation regarding the anatomy and its significance and uh, all the, whether if you are, uh, you can download the app, which is I think an excellent app. Nevertheless, I would just like to remind you of this article by uh, Womal and other, his associates. It says the anatomical landmarks of the lateral nasal wall implications for endonasal lacrimal surgery. So all of you young surgeons who plan to embark on doing endonasal DCR should please go through this uh, uh, article. It's in the current opinion of ophthalmology 2015, and it's an excellent review of the nasal anatomy. Okay, and uh, it is free. So I think I, you uh, can do this. And if you have the option, you can also go for the uh, app, uh, the uh, uh, iMac app that uh, Professor Natterwood, Dr. Natterwood talked about. Now, I, so we'll move on to the surgical part of it. So just going back, just to give you a few idea of the, uh, what you will be looking at. Basically now the problem most of the uh, uh, young surgeons have when they're doing endonasal DCR or that I faced was, you know, you're looking through the opposite side of the tunnel, you see. We are so much, uh, we get a lot of exposure doing external DCRs during our residencies, but we do not get enough exposure doing endonasal DCRs or even uh, evaluating the ENT. We just send it to the ENT surgeon. So first thing you have to make it a habit of evaluation evaluating all your DCR patients, the ENT nasal cavity evaluations yourself so that you can familiarize yourself with the anatomy. And uh, because otherwise it's gonna be very difficult. Everything is opposite, you know? Uh, so here's a diagrammatic representation of some of the important features. So you are, is, this is the left nasal cavity, the lateral wall, this is the nasal septum, middle turbinate, the uncinate process, and this is the frontal process of the maxillary bone, and that's the maxillary rind. That's where your all your surgical this thing is concentrated on. And this is to, uh, to show you my technique where I put a uh, fiber optic indo illumination through the canaliculus into the lacrimal sac. So you can see the illumination over here. It's not very clear now, but once you take off the mucosa and the bone, it becomes more clear. And you can see the uh, maxillary line over the uh, frontal process of the maxilla, the uncinate process, the medial turbinate, and the nasal septum. So this is where you start with. And so these are the few of the instruments. The instruments are very basic. Again, another thing you have to familiarize besides after the anatomy comes the instruments, because most of the instruments are ENT instruments that you will be using. So you have the fiber optic light source, you have the sickle knives, you have the freer cortical uh, elevators. I prefer the one with a sharp edge and a blunt edge. So you can actually cut the mucosa and do a sharp dissection and also a blunt dissection. You have a kerosene bone rongers, ethmoid forceps, okay? So usually uh, you can use either a wheel Blexley or a Takahashi and you have oral forceps for finer dissections. And sometimes you can use, uh, you may need a roton forceps, the neurosurgical. Uh, this is a kerosene ronger. Usually this is our normal size, but I prefer the seven inch one, which is used in ENT or the uh, uh, neurosurgical uh, kerosene rongers. So here's the, basically I'm trying to say, uh, so I'll be concentrating more on the procedure. So just to give you an idea what you can do in a very, uh, you don't need a lot of big setup and with, with few instruments and the usual instruments and uh, equipment that you're using for your DCRs, uh, you can actually uh, convert to endonasal DCR. So this is a setup, okay? And this is your fiber optic eye source. You, you can use an old microscope thrown away. I used a thrown away microscope. I used that fiber optic attached to a microscope light source. And then this is how I perform the procedure. So for the uh, left nasal cavity, you will be sitting on your right side of the patient and likewise, uh, vice versa. So the first uh, step, all my DCRs, whether external or endonasals are performed under local anesthesia. So 
I start with giving a inferior uh, trochlear nerve block, and then you go inside the nose, and this is the diagram I've shown before, and this is the site of injection. So you inject 2% lidocaine with adrenaline over this point. So there you can see I've injected, you can see a little bit of bleeding here, and this will anesthetize the nasal cavity, the nasal mucosa, as well as uh, cause vasoconstriction, so lessen the bleeding. And then it is packed with the uh, gauze piece, soaked in 50-50 solution of uh, lidocaine with uh, xylometazoline, and, uh, nasal drops. Then we start the procedure. So this is the light source going into the nasal, uh, to the lacrimal fossa and the lacrimal sac. And you make us use a sickle knife to cut a oval opening in the nasal mucosa. This is followed by removing the uh, mucosa with the help of a takahashi or a ethmoid forceps. And then once you, the bone, bone is exposed, then you use a kerosene ronger and you go through the lacrimal bone and then you cut into the frontal process of the maxilla. And then gradually you go uh, anteriorly and inferiorly, and then you go superiorly and uh, <clears throat> Uh, superiorly and posteriorly till you reach, you can get a good illumination. So you can see, now you can see the fiber optic illumination uh, in the lacrimal sac itself. And this is the bony opening. This uh, has to be, I mean, enlarged a little bit as Dr. N uh, Natawad uh, uh, said that this has to be a fairly large opening. So you can see the fiber optic and this is a good technique that I learned and it always uh, gui will be guiding you to the exact site of the surgery. So you can see the fiber optic here. And then again, with a sickle knife again, you make a incision in the sac and then you tear, then you incise the sac. And uh, so like he, it's been mentioned before, you have to have a large bony opening and the sac opening has to be the same size as the bony opening. Otherwise you are gonna have the something syndrome, okay? And then after that, uh, we, uh, this thing, uh, Stent all our cases. So this is a stenting with a groove director uh, because we are not using an endoscope. So we just use a groove director to uh, stent the patient. And so this is what you can, I'd like to, I always show this patient for clarity because you can see uh, this is a patient with a lar large lacrimal sac abscess and uh, we control the cellulitis and then we go straight for DCR. We don't have to wait like an external DCR. And then this is uh, two days post-op and this is, one month post-op. So you can see not much scarring and uh, she's doing quite well. This is another patient with uh, endonasal DCR, no scarring, and she's uh, doing very well. She still has the stents in place, you can see. Uh, these are some other examples. This was another lady with the abscess, lacrimal abscess, where that we uh, did an endonasal DCR. Uh, and this is another lady with a lacrimal abscess. They look same, but it's not the same lady. And this is an, uh, and this is what it looks like after endonasal DCR, no scarring. And there's the uh, silastic tube is in place. You can see the silastic tube nicely in place. And there's uh, the lacrimal, uh, if you do a fluorescein dye disappearance test, it is negative. So this is uh, basically uh, uh, the procedure itself. Now, what were our results? Just uh, to tell you, this was, uh, a study done way back in 2008, our results were published in this thing, uh, Kathmandu University Medical Journal. And uh, this was a case of total of 302 uh, DCR cases that we could find, which uh, fulfilled our criteria of uh, uh, what is a success, what is a failure and primary follow-up. So at six months follow-up, we had 300, we could find only 300, we could find 302 cases of DCRs of which 137 were external DCRs, 165 were uh, endonasal DCRs, of which uh, the success rate was 124 and 146. So it came to around 90.5 success rate for external DCRs, 88.5 for uh, endonasal DCRs. Statistically, p-value was not significant. So we concluded that basically uh, what happens is uh, so that Endonasal DCR, non-endoscopic, mechanical, just using kerosene rongers gave you comparable results to external DCR. So, uh, th and this is what, 
So causes, let's go to the causes of failure. So the primary causes of failure were, one was the fibrosis around the internal ostium. The other was the uh, stent cut through with canalicular scarring and nasal mucosal synechia. It was interesting because uh, the complications were not many. So there were one with two major hemorrhages, which we had to take back to the op operating room to pack, uh, and primarily in endonasal DCRs. Obviously, wound infection, gaping, four cases. Then late, sorry, late, uh, this is interesting because the late complications were primarily external, uh, were 24 patients with canalicular silastic to cut through, of which seven were with, uh, seven were in external DCR, of which one failed. The rest, 17 were in endonasal patients and six failures. So this was primarily due to the reason that in uh, our earlier stages, when we, we just started endonasal DCRs, what was happening was uh, because we had to use a blind technique with a groove director to, uh, 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 to stent the canaliculus, there was a little bit of uh, this thing. Either uh, there was, we tend to have uh, this thing, too much tight stents. So which resulted in uh, this thing, canalicular cheese wiring and with failures, six failures actually. Uh, nasal mucosa synechia was found in eight patients and this is basically related to your surgical trauma and all cases, and these were all cases of endonasal DCRs of which three failed. So these were the our results. Other results have shown um, similar results. So uh, between 90% and an average of 90% of uh, success rate uh, comparing both external and endonasal DCRs, you have seen. Even uh, the Indian reports by Rath et al., they give the same around 86 to 85% uh, success rate. And then recently, there was a study by this thing, uh, uh, done by AO, and this was a report, comparison of uh, endonasal DCRs and external DCRs report by the AO and was uh, conducted by Sobel et al., and they reviewed 13 uh, uh, papers related to where they compared the endoscopic DCRs with uh, endonasal, uh, endo, endonasal DCRs with external DCRs. What they found was basically, uh, except for three cases, all other cases had uniform results. So around between all of them were around, around 90, between 85 to 90% success rate in both uh, comparing endonasal DCRs and external DCRs, whether they were mechanical, whether they were using rongers, or whether they were using drills, uh, whether they were endoscopic, whether they were non-endoscopic. Only difference was in one of the studies of Ben Simon, where there was a very high difference in uh, success in between uh, endoscopic and external DCR, where there was a 70% external DCR and 84% endoscopic DCR. So this was statistically significant. And there was another case by uh, uh, Watts, where the, and another case by Mi, Mira, where the external DCR success rate was very low. Otherwise, most of the other studies have uh, pointed to a comparative results between external DCR and endonasal DCR, whatever the technique of endonasal DCR. Only thing I have to point out that the low endoscopic success in these could be attributed to the fact that these were cases of uh, laser endoscopic DCRs, okay, these, both these cases where there was a low success rate, uh, it was, uh, these were done by uh, and, uh, laser endoscopic DCRs. More recently in Lumbini Eye Institute, Dr. Bhattrai has, uh, this is unpublished data, so she has given me this data of where she had done 38 cases in the past uh, two years and uh, 28 of them completed six months follow-up of them, three had anatomical failures. So again, she had a success rate around 89%. So I think uh, recommendations for endonasal DCR, I would say it has a steep learning curve, but it is not as steep as with the endoscope. I think uh, endoscope is a whole new setup that you have to get used to, okay. And uh, I usually recommend it as a primary procedure uh, in uh, NLDO with normal or large sacs where there's adequate nasal space. And I usually advocate it for young patients females, uh, early cases, preferably under GA, but all the later cases after my training, I've done under local anesthesia because general anesthesia was not available anyway in those times in 2004. And I really advocated for acute dacrocystitis and lacrimal abscess where once the cellulitis is 
controlled, you can go ahead and do a DCR uh, early. So who are the poor candidates? I avoid uh, endonasal DCRs in fibrotic lacrimal sacs, anything with canalicular pathology, uh, traumatic nasolacrimal duct obstruction, uh, suspicious of lacrimal sac tumors, and repeat DCRs, I always go for external DCRs. It's just uh, my comfort zone, okay? So thank you all for being patient. And if you have any questions, I think I'll leave for the panelists to have the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. It was a great presentation and uh, interesting methods and good results. So, and as I guess, we will definitely go to your suggestions. Now I would like to request our panelist, Professor Dr. Grover, to give his view on this topic. Thank you, Dr. Basant Raj, for your excellent presentation. It was, it highlighted the technique very well and it showed us what the advantages, indications and contraindications are. And I think a number of uh, series from around the world have confirmed that this is a procedure which can be learned well and can be undertaken with very high success rates. They've been done in pediatric cases as well. My questions pertain to a couple of things. One is, you've trained a lot of people. How long do your students take to get to a reasonable degree of proficiency and good level of uh, correction? Okay. Second, you've answered it yeah. by partially yeah. Yeah. that cases with the uh, with narrow cavities like deviated nasal septum, would you do them in this technique as well uh, simultaneously or would you prefer the nasal septum to have been taken care of earlier before you undertake this procedure? Okay. So first thing, I, uh, when I uh, was doing these uh, surgeries in my institute, at, now I'm in private practice. So at that time, we did not have a fellowship. We do not. Uh, we did not have a fellowship program. So personally, I have not trained anybody till now, and that's the reason I said we have spent 16 years and we have lagged behind in this training program, which we should. I think we all are responsible for. We failed to do our duty as far as that was concerned, but we had a lot of limitations then. We didn't have general anesthesia. We didn't have a fellowship program, and uh, uh, we didn't have the setup, whole setup for our training. Approach. And by the time I left the institute. This thing was, I just start, I had just started this uh, whole setup then, and then I had to leave the institute for various reasons. But then uh, the, uh, the person who took over after that, she had trained under me. So she's the only one whom I have partially trained, let's say partially trained. But that is, I'm sorry to say that, but that is what I was trying to highlight today that after 16 years, you know, all the eye institutions that we have, there are, I think just three eye institutes that do endonasal DCRs, and that also not on a very large scale. I think not even 50% of the cases are endonasal. So I think this is where we are lagging behind. And this is where we really have to gear up. And probably this will be discussed in the panel discussions later on how we can actually uh, get together and start, you know, encourage more young people to do endonasal DCRs in future, which at least where there's a demand, because this, you know, there is a demand now for endonasal DCRs because uh, uh, three fourth, 75% of our, uh, our young females are DCR. If you go through the demography of uh, DCRs, at least in our part of the world, is young females constitute 75% of the uh, DCR population. So I think that it's a. Uh, I think it is high time that we actually geared up uh, us, you know, who uh, who have been very selfish, I would say, actually, uh, in not training enough people doing that. And so what was the second question? Would you uh, do a de uh, deviated septum to that side? Oh, no. Uh, I, no, I just leave it. I just evaluate it, have it evaluated. A lot of times what I do is if there's a deviated septum and it's usually on the left side. So operating on the left side is a bit easier. So I use, uh, instead of, a, I try to push with, like he said, with a pre or but I just use the nasal uh, speculum and I try to use the nasal speculum to open up and push the septum. Uh, but it's not easy because, uh, mm -hmm. so I uh, see how much the deviation is. If it's not too much deviation, and if I feel I can push the, with this, because I'm using a single handed technique, because one hand goes for the, so. And yeah, that's true for all, most uh, yeah, Yes, most of, except for Dr. Natawood, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we have to use all, just a single hand, the other hand is with the speculum. So if I can push, if I feel I can, and preoperatively, I will evaluate and see if I can push the nasal septum adequately, open it up with a, a nasal speculum, then I'll go ahead. Otherwise, I, my, I said my comfort zone is I never hesitate to do external DCRs. You know. And one a little question again. Yes. 
the intubation you are doing intubation in almost 100% of the cases yes yes in endonasal right? pcrs right yes in these cases yes yeah, thalassic intubation um, yes. and i think uh, that's a fair thing to do and uh, it is yielding good results neta i wanted to ask neta but uh, he is doing a flap suturing as well does he think that uh, a tube is necessary for his cases too or uh, like most external dcr surgeons would not put in a tube would you be since you are doing the entire process including suturing would you still think a intubation is necessary for you um actually i i even though i try to move to do the good nasal ostium and do the very good pap suturing i always put the in intubation silicone stand because at least um, the when we put the silicone intubation uh, the 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 effect of the intubation try to make the anterior flap move anteriorly that gonna make the even though you do not um, do the flap choosing and you keep the put the stand and fit the stand with the nasal mucosa uh, 0.5 milli, uh, centimeter and suturing with the 5 opoline that can keep the stand anteriorly and that another effect that put the anterior flap uh, anteriorly that 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 help and and in the 10 years ago I, I put the gel foam and put the Kennecott in the gel foam but for the past 10 years I did not do that one anymore because sometimes when they put the gel foam they have the nasal discharge. They can make the like uh, cannulation. So I do believe that um, if we do the very good uh, uh, approximation of the flap and very good anatomy approximation, I think um, uh, uh, we're gonna get the hundred percent result. But uh, if you use one minute, one one minute to do the two minutes to do the intubation. Uh, and that how to optimize the sex rate, I would do that. And and one point that the um, yeah yeah that's that's my 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 point. And one last question to both of you: How many times do you think you are able to prevent a failure by good postoperative endoscopic follow up? Oh, and how important is it? Um, I think the main the main factor is to to do intraoperative operate cheap, very good. In some condition, uh, we use an endoscope. In, unfortunately, I have the endoscope unit in my clinic and I use at, at one week, uh, one day, one week, and uh, one month. I, I, I keep staying only uh, three or four weeks and then I take it out and we got very good uh, result from that part. One of the points in the care that have the difficult time of the septal deviation, if you do that one and you disturb the septal mucosa a lot, you're going to bleed a lot. That's the point. And if you disturb the nasal mucosa and the septal mucosa a lot, and you did not put some, some, some material to block the uh, approximation of the septal and nasal mucosa together, that can lead to the adhesion after the surgery because of the septal mucosa away, uh, mucosa gonna be swelling and the patient have already have the septal mucosa, the more swelling, the more approximation. So many times that we found that even though, yeah. And so I put the, I use a silastic sheet and cut in the shape mm -hmm. like, a, a, like a warmer at the, uh, and put the silastic sheet inside the, uh, 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 inside the nasal cavity and keep for seven to 10 days. And then when the swelling subside, the benefit that I put the silastic sheet gonna block the adhesion between the septal and uh, nasal mucosa. And secondly, if they have the bleeding, the bleeding will uh, come along down by the cavity to the uh, nasal trough and, and, and come down to the trough and no nasal clot so much. That, Another second benefit from the from the silastic sheet that I suturing and I keep only one one week and then remove all that that help for prevent the uh, attrition. Dr. Basantraj, the importance of uh, post op. Yes, okay. post op uh, is very important, and I think because uh, you know, but uh, the problem with our patients is they never uh, the follow up is very irregular. So in our series, when I went through the files, 
almost 25% of the patients didn't come for follow-up after one month. So that's the problem. And a lot of them actually come for, you know, they come after one or two years and they still have the silastic tube hanging in their nose. So, uh, but the issue is, uh, I think, uh, wherever possible, I, wherever possible, especially for my local patients, I have them come for regular follow-ups. I don't have an endoscope in my clinic, but uh, you can actually, you don't need an endoscope. With the loops and with a nasal speculum, you can actually evaluate and see if there's excessive crusting or anything. And sometimes even through the canaliculus, you can do a syringing and see to clear up the, this thing, uh, to clear up the nasal cavity. So that is what I do. So if the patient is... Uh, can come. I usually see on the first post-op day, uh, uh, see the navel, nasal cavity, and on the sec uh, and second week. But if the patient is not unable to follow up, you know, a lot of the patients come very from very far away. I usually try to call them at one month, and I keep the in those days I kept the silastic tube for uh, three months actually in that study. So three months, was, uh, and uh, probably I would have avoided cutting through and things like that if I had uh, removed the silastic tube earlier. But in those days, that's how we were doing, you know, we were keeping a silastic tubes for three months and it's only now we trying to remove it more earlier. But yes, uh, post-operative evaluation of the nasal cavity, even if you don't have an endoscope, you know, you can do it with a nasal speculum and loop and torchlight examination. I think it is very important, I think, to do that. And if your patients can come for follow-up, I would say first post-op day, okay. And then at least uh, on the second week post-op. I would like to see them again, but it's very difficult. A uh, lot of times, you know, they just don't come. For, uh, Thank you very awesome. much. Thank you very much for your insight. Yes, Dr. Boshan, congratulations for the nice presentation. I uh, have an uh, idea just uh, came on in my mind that this lacrimal highway can be connected through our national highway to reach your technique of non-endoscopic ECR surgery to our <laughs> major eye hospitals because it is less expensive. Yes. and quick learning in compared to the endoscopic DCR okay. and can be done in different part of the country where the patient cannot afford for full endoscopic DCR. Right. So I want to know from the Dr. Ashok that I know one of the giant from India is Dr. Suresh Rath, who is doing non-endoscopic DCR for a long time and presenting and spreading that. Is that in your Indian practice, is it so popular nowadays? Are other part of the country also doing a lot? I have only seen the series from uh, Suresh Nath Rath from um, Odisha. Uh, I have not seen any other series. There may be other surgeons who are doing uh, non-endoscopic endonasal DCR, but he's the only one who's presented in oculoplasty meetings. Yes. A lot many people are doing endoscopic. Yeah. I just want to comment on, the, uh, on silicon intubation. I think I agree with Nathawood that, uh, you know, very important to put, uh, I advocate silicon intubation because, you know, if it happens that you have had what you call synechia between your uh, intranasal ostium and then the uh, septum, uh, it will be very, uh, you know, safe to put the silicon intubation. One other use of silicon intubation is, of course, if there is a concomitant canalicular stenosis or obstruction, and it helps very lot. Uh, as they say, let no one underestimate the uh, security it helps to those who need it. But of course, if you are uh, well, very confident that you have uh, do, did a, uh, done a wide marsupialization, a large bony ostium, then uh, you can uh, obviate uh, doing a silicon intubation. Thank That's you. It. Thank you all. Thank you all for the wonderful discussion once again. So uh, we move on with this uh, session with a talk from our distinguished guest uh, speaker, Professor Dr. Havati. Professor Dr. Havati is a former chairman and chief of lacrimal orbital and oculofacial plastic surgery section of University of Santo Tomas Hospital, Philippines. He is a former president of Philippine Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, for founding president of um, episodes and former president of 10th Congress of International Society of Dacryology and Dry Eye. So I hand over the uh, screen to you, sir. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, Dr. Professor, uh, Professor Dr. Havati will be sharing his experience on our user-friendly microendoscope in optimizing clinical outcomes of transcanalicular endoscopic lacrimal doctor canalization. I'm sorry. So good evening, wherever you are. 
Can you see my slide? Yes, so we can see your slide. Yes, okay. So good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for tuning in to this Zoom broadcast. This lecture is entitled, A User-Friendly Trefine Microendoscope in Optimizing Clinical Outcomes in Transcanalicular Endoscopic Lacrimal Duct Recanalization, or TELDR in patients with complete primary acquired nasolacrimal duct obstruction. By the way, I have no financial interest to disclose. In the midst of pandemic brought about by the SARS-CoV-2, or commonly known as the novel coronavirus, oculoplastic surgeons are at particularly high risk for transmission of COVID-19 given the specific procedures we perform. Now the field of oculoplastic surgery focuses on the eyelids, orbit, ocular and nexa, and nasolacrimal duct system. Given the fact that oculoplastic surgeons operate on the nasolacrimal region, as well as the orbit and sinuses, they are at risk for aerosolization of viral particles from nasal mucosa or other mucosal surfaces. Lacrimal surgeons practice are affected by COVID-19 and to bring this pandemic to an end, a large share of the world needs to be immune to the virus. The safest way of course is to achieve this with vaccine. However, the challenge is to make these vaccines available for people around the world. Since not everyone receives the full vaccine, the presence of the virus remains a threat and we need to learn on how to deal with it. Now in patients with PANDO, which is described as an entity of nasolacrimal duct obstruction caused by inflammation or fibrosis without any precipitating cause, DCR is the primary treatment for PANDO. And you know very well that DCR is an aerosol generating procedure. Now in endoscopic endonasal DCR, drills and debriders are often used within the nasal cavity for removal of bone. And this may produce aerosol droplets that can be extremely infectious and dangerous. The use of powered instruments like endoscopic drills, radio frequency and electrocautery are being avoided or restricted to minimum since any respiratory mucosal manipulations by this may have the potential to aerosolize the virus which becomes airborne for several hours and may contaminate several surfaces in the operating room, thereby risking the operating room staff. The minimally invasive lacrimal surgery, which I call the transcanalicular endoscopic lacrimal duct recanalization or TELDR, is primarily used to treat patients with complete and partial nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Now, it restores the integrity of the natural lacrimal drainage system in patients with canalicular and nasolacrimal duct obstruction. It is a surgical approach that avoids necessity of making new openings through the medial lacrimal sac wall and then the lacrimal fossa and lateral nasal wall, all of which are required in endoscopic transnasal and standard external DCR procedures. Recanalization of the nasolacrimal duct, therefore, should be the least invasive of all these techniques. Now, what are the objectives of TELDR surgery? The objectives of TELDR surgery is to remove the obstruction and fibrous obliteration of the nasolacrimal duct, prevent acute duct resistitis with lacrimal sac abscess formation, and of course, prevents reobstruction. We are fortunate to have a variety of new technology that we can use for the purposes of our recanalization as shown in this slide. What are the complications of TELDR? Well, there are no major complications of the procedure, only minor such as damage to the fibroelastic punctal ring, extravasation of fluid causing edema and hematoma of the surrounding soft tissues and false passage or false root. So how do we prevent damage to the fibroelastic punctal ring and cutting through the horizontal canaliculus? How do we reduce the incidence of extravasation? How do we avoid false passage? How do we prevent reobstruction? First, how do we prevent damage to the punctal ring and how do we reduce the incidence of extravasation? Size variation of the lacrimal punctum in adults is studied by Carter et al. demonstrated variation in lacrimal punctal sizes. The upper puncta showed a mean area of 0.2 millimeter, while the lower puncta showed a mean area 
of 0.3 millimeter. Now, we conducted our study on Filipino patients and of the 912 lower Fongta, 73% measured 0.4 millimeter. Now, Tucker et al. published an article on the anatomy of the common canaliculus, the canaliculi bend at the canaliculus junction at an angle of 118 degrees and before passing anteriorly to enter the lacrimal sac area at an acute angle of 58 degrees. Now, this size variation of the lacrimal pontum in anatomy of the common canaliculus are important to consider when doing recanalization of the nasolacrimal system. I have designed a smaller outside diameter lacrimal refine of one millimeter for those with small size pontum. And previous design of the lacrimal refine actually measured 1.3 millimeter outside diameter, which will actually create damage to the small size punctum causing cheese wiring and uh, damage to the common canaliculus resulting, as you can see here, in extravasation of fluid and edema in the surrounding soft tissues. Here are some Caucasian and Asian patients of mine seen in my clinic with small punctal sizes and the appropriate refine in this patient should be one millimeter to avoid damage to the punctum and canaliculus. Interestingly, Japanese have a mean size of the lower and upper lacrimal puncta of 0.6 millimeter. Second, how do we avoid false passage? Prominent frontal bone during the passage of the trifine, as you can see here in this slide, the, the trifine microendoscope as it goes down into the sac, nasolacrimal duct, which is the sac duct junction, the lacrimal trifine will hit the posterior wall a scene here of the lacrimal sac during its descent, especially in patients with prominent frontal bone. As such, the trifine with a microendoscope should be slightly bent to allow its smooth passage into the sac duct junction or opening of the nasolacrimal duct. What about lacrimal sac movement? Under positive pressure, the lateral wall moved outward but it moved inward under negative pressure. This movement of the lateral wall of the lacrimal sac will also serve as a guide to the direction of the trifine to avoid false passage, particularly in patients with complete obstruction or generalized obstruction, which starts from the lacrimal sac where you almost cannot visualize the lumen of the sac as seen in this patient. Now, nasolacrimal duct inclination. Okay, what about this? I think this is a very important guide to avoid false passage. This was taken from the book of Lemke and De La Roca on surgery of the eyelids in orbit and anatomical approach, wherein clinically, the lateral divergence of the descending course of the nasolacrimal duct can serve as a guide to avoid false passage, which can be estimated by drawing a line which is between this, uh, as you can see here, between the tear sac and the alanasi. Now, individuals with narrow interorbital distances and wide noses will show the greatest lateral divergence of along the descending course of the nasolacrimal duct. And this is the outward type. Now, those with wide interorbital distances and narrow noses, as you can see here, will exhibit a more vertical divergence of the descending course of the nasolacrimal duct, and this is the inward type. What about in fracture of the inferior turbinate? I do this before the start of the procedure because it is very important to remember that during the procedure, just like when you are doing uh, nasolacrimal duct probing, that the nasolacrimal duct angles posteriorly approximately 15 degrees, as you can see here, as well as 10 degrees medially as the canal descends from the lacrimal fossa to the nose. Now the angle can be clinically estimated actually by a line connecting the lacrimal fossa to the first molar tooth. Now it's also very important to infracture the middle turbinate, uh, the inferior turbinate, because that is where you can have the access to the area where the nasolacrimal duct empties into the inferior meatus. And it is facilitated by infracturing the inferior turbinate medially or in cases when the inferior turbinate is tightly adherent 
uh, actually tightly adherent to the uh, lateral wall of the nose and to avoid false passage of the trephine into the substance of the inferior turbinate, you really have to do a uh, mobilization of the inferior turbinate medially. And third, how do we prevent reobstruction? Meticulous endoscopic technique starts with proper equipment. And after recanalization, balloon dilatation of the nasolacrimal duct is performed using this optocath lacrimal duct balloon catheter. The integration of balloon dacryoplast technique in TLDR improve the outcomes of treatment. The lumen of the nasolacrimal duct, as you can see here, is geometrically widened, as seen in this slide. Now, the widened nasolacrimal duct lumen permits easier silicon stent intubation, smooth canalicular irrigation, and increased flow volume on follow-ups. Now, once recanalization and balloon dacryoplasty has been completed, you can use a Crawford bicanaliculus intubation stent, which is inserted to prevent post-operative adhesion of the mucosal lining of the lacrimal excretory system for a Ritling plus intubation stent, or which is my favorite, the Nunchaku silicon stent with thick tube segments. The Nunchaku is actually a pushed silicon self-retaining bicanalicular stent and is left in place for two months. In this uh, uh, or video, you can see that you know, the insertion of the uh, silicon of the nunchaku and it is visualized the ends of it in the uh, area where you have the, uh, the uh, you have done the infracture of the inferior turbinate to be able to visualize the ends of the tube. Now with a microendoscopic transcanalicular approach, it is possible to directly visualize and treat the site of obstruction and in the lacrimal outflow system without altering it's a structural and physiologic integrity. And here's a patient with bilateral complete primary acquired nasolacrimal duct obstruction done by my residents under my supervision. On the right side, uh, they perform external DCR and on the left side, transcanalicular endoscopic lacrimal duct regularization one day after the procedures. And these are some of my patients in my clinic. You can see before, and one day after transcanalicular endoscopic lacrimal duct regionalization in five year post -op. Now, canalicular irrigation, uh, as I've mentioned, follow up is very important with steroid laden antibiotic drops on follow up is done to evaluate what the patency and, of course, reduces the early inflammatory reaction, thus breaking the vicious cycle of obstruction and infection. What about proper selection of patients? Patients with complete or partial pando in canalicular stenosis are good candidates. Those that are not, uh, you know, uh, good candidates are those with bony alteration or stenosis, uh, previous fractures, patients with mucosil in the lacrimal sac, and of course, patients with a history of acute dacryocystitis are not considered good candidates. Okay. We conducted a study on TLDR with balloon dacryoplasty and silicon intubation, and the success rate of TLDR with PD and uh, silicon intubation is shown here, and it is statistically significant uh, compared to that of SEDCR. Hence, we're equivalent in the treatment of complete PANDO. I would just like to show you a short video of the procedure, and you can see how I mark the, uh, you know, uh, the descent of the nasolacrimal duct, the inclination. Of course, after uh, you know dilating the uh, punctum, you can insert your trephine with a microendoscope. This is the user-friendly microendoscope that I am uh, referring to. And uh, after the horizontal orientation, then you can proceed with the vertical orientation so that it will visualize now the sac and the nasolacrimal duct and remove the uh, or pierce the obstruction in the sac duct junction as well as in the nasolacrimal duct. And after you have pierced through the obstruction, you'll be able to visualize the tip of the uh, trephine and microendoscope. And then you can do this uh, balloon uh, dilatation of the nasolacrimal duct, which will give you many of the advantages, such as, of course, uh, you know, high flow uh, volume when you irrigate the sac.
and this is a uh, nunchaku intubation. So in summary, uh, to optimize clinical outcome of transcanalicular endoscopic lacrimal duct recanalization, uh, modifications and refinements in the technique in the last 16 years and technology of TALDR and proper patient selection is very important to identify patients that will benefit most from doing recanalization procedure. In conclusion, transcanalicular endoscopic lacrimal duct recanalization is a viable alternative and which may obviate more invasive method in patients with nasolacrimal duct obstruction, whether of complete or partial, particularly in this time of pandemic, uh, you know, uh, COVID uh, times. And it allows concomitant management of conolicular stenosis. It decreases morbidity, such as risk of bleeding. Transcanalicular surgery may be more familiar to the ophthalmologist. And of course, no disfigurement is encountered. It made possible the treatment of obstruction in the lacrimal outflow system without altering its structural and physiologic integrity along with decreased chances of SARS-CoV-2 transmission. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention, and I will be happy to answer any question or please feel free to email me. Thank you for again for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hawate, for that wonderful presentation. And it was really an honor to have you here as a guest speaker and listen from your past, from your experiences. And we are so amazed. It's so soothing to our eyes and so even to see your uh, patients' photographs and even comparison of before and after photographs. They are really very wonderful. And if you have uh, if, uh, for any questions for Professor Hawate is there, we can discuss them in panel discussion session. And now we will straight forward move on to our uh, next speaker. Uh, I would like to invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. Saeed Mehboob Ul Qadir from Bangladesh, who will be talking on topic top tricks in external DCR with us today. Dr. Qadir is an assistant professor in Sheikh Fajilatunissa Muzib Eye Hospital and Teaching Institute, Bangladesh. He is also a visiting consultant orbit or ophthalmic plastic service in Bangladesh Eye Hospital and Institute Dhaka, Bangladesh. He is treasurer of Opal Plastic Society of South Asia. Dr. Kati has more than 60 scientific presentations and about 50 publications in both national as well as international journals. And he serves actively as associate editor and editorial board member in multiple journals. Dr. Kadir has received numerous prestigious awards, including a POW Achievement Award in the year 2018 and IESRF Research Award in the year 2021. We are very excited to have you here today, sir. And uh, this screen is now yours, sir. You can share your presentation. Thank you, Professor Rajshaju, Dr. Ben Limbo, and Nepalese Society for Oculoplastic Surgeons to invite me here and also to meet with legendary oculoplastic surgeons like uh, Professor Javate and Professor Ashok Kumar Grover. Thank you all. There are many options to do decorosis or anastomy surgery, namely transcanicular laser this year, endoscopic non laser this year endoscopic endo laser this year, but external this year continues to be the gold standard. There are many indications to do external this years, but primary acquired natural duct obstruction with or without dacrocystitis is the most common indication. Patient selection is very important, especially for beginners attempting to do this year. Best sac for doing this year is the one with mucosil because sac is bigger and flaps are easily made. Elderly patient with roomy nostril due to easy of bone punching and chance for less bleeding is the uh, good choice to do external this year, especially for uh, beginners. Patients with positive Regurgitation tests are also ideal candidates. The following investigations should be done before external DCR surgery. 
complete blood count, bleeding time, clotting time, blood sugar, fasting, and two hours after breakfast, serum creatinine, blood grouping, and HBS AG, ECG, chest X ray. NT evaluation should be done to rule out atrophic rhinitis and other nasal abnormalities. Blood pressure control is very important to decrease the risk of bleeding intraoperatively. But in this COVID era, RT-PCR for COVID-19 is mandatory for external DCR surgery. Perioperative medication, nasal decongestant drugs should be started twice daily, three days prior to surgery. Do not stop the uh, previous medication for hypertension, diabetes mellitus, thyroid disease, and epilepsy. Stop anticoagulant drugs uh, at least five days prior to surgery. Local anesthesia with intravenous sedation is preferred as it reduces stress, which in turn decreases bleeding. Local anesthesia is given as infratoclear block, dorsal nasal block, infraorbital block, and anterior block. Nasal packing is very important for external DCR surgery to keep the mucosa taut and also to reduce bleeding intraoperatively and also postoperatively. The uh, position of uh, nasal, uh, nasal packing is at middle meters. Skin incision is important for external DCR. Uh, there are three types of skin incision are using for external DCR. Straight incision are 10 to 15 millimeter long and 10 millimeter distant to medial canthus, but it causes more visible scar. Uh, I prefer J-shaped carbilinear incision that is 4 millimeter from the medial canthus and 10 to 15 millimeter long along the anterior lacrimal crest. And another uh, incision type is subciliary incision. Uh, it is just below 2 millimeter from the lash line and uh, 10 to 15 millimeter long from the punctum to the uh, point along the uh, mid pupillary line. Thus, another study uh, is a study done on subciliary incision. Uh, the study reports 94.4% uh, patients uh, presented with no scars at three months of surgery. After the skin incision, uh, blunt dissection uh, through orbicular muscles along the total uh, incision line and identify the uh, medial particular ligament. Once the medial particular ligament is exposed, uh, the disinsertion of medial particular ligament is done at the anterolacrimal crest. Disinsertion of medial particular ligament automatically opens up the periosteum and then separation of periosteum along the entire length of the incision superiorly, inferiorly, and posteriorly to the lamina papyracea. Uh, then uh, the periosteum with lacrimal sac is detected and uh, bony osteum can meet thereafter. This is the short video of external DCR. I usually use uh, element radio frequency cautery, and sometimes I using a 15 degree FACO knife for skin incision, then blunt dissection through orbicular soculi muscle along the incision line, and Identify the medial palpebral ligament. And uh, expose the black metal bone. Large ostium is the important for good outcome of external DCR and also for the passes from the caniculi and 
to the ostium the dish and it is important to remove all irregularities of the bony ostium this is the uh, to check the passes now uh, flap of the discharge surgery there are uh, two types of uh, flap procedure that is combined procedure combined posterior flap and anterior suspended flap versus anterior suspended flaps for external discharge uh, a study reported that observed 98.9 percent success rate for combined flap and another study reported on single anterior suspended flap they reported a 96 percent success rate by and single anterior suspended flap so there is no significant statistically different between combined flap and anterior segment anterior suspended flap but anterior suspended flap require less surgical time I always prefer medial palpebral ligament anastomosis to prevent medial canthal deformity postoperatively. Now, wound closure and prevent skin scarring. To prevent skin scarring, a better. Uh, for external disease, uh, precise carbilinear or subsidiary skin incision, which provides a less or no skin scarring postoperatively. Closure of wound in layers also prevents skin scarring postoperatively. Six zero vehicle is preferable. Uh, Suture material, interdermal stitch uh, gives better cosmetic outcome than interrupted stitch, but interrupted stitch uh, give a good. Yeah. Wound health. Uh, we may use medications to reduce scar postoperatively. In our study on 112 cases, we used carb J shaped carbilinear incision or carb incision. Skin scarring is visible only 12 cases, that is 11% at three months of surgery. For a special situation, acute decrocystitis, uh, we have done few cases uh, uh, of external research surgery uh, in the cases of acute decrocystitis, but, but better to wait. This can be done after starting of five to seven days of antibiotics, lacrimal fistula with chondidecrocystitis. This year with fistulectomy is the best option for canicular stenosis, this year with long-term intubation is the best option for lacrimal sac tumors, initial DCT, later modified decrocystitis uh, surgery. mid trauma, uh, reconstruction orbital wall is needed. Success rate, primary acquired nasal duct obstruction uh, cases, success rate is more than other cases or failed this year or uh, secondary acquired nasal duct obstruction. Primary this year with or without silicon tube intubation. Uh, there are many studies reported on with or without silicon tube in intubation, but most of the studies reported there was no significant difference in the success rates between the this year with or without silicon tube intubation. Second type intubation is mandatory in the cases of re -DCR. Another meta-analysis for comparing the success rate of DCR with or without silicon tube intubation, uh, they reported that DCR with intubation achieved better results than DCR without intubation. Early versus standard versus late removal of silicon tube intubation. There are many studies for removal of silicon tube intubation. Uh, a study reported on one-week intubation in external dacrocystorhinostomy surgery. 
a, a report on long term outcome they reported functional success at 93% and that study on the outcome of silicon intubation and tube removal in external lacrosistor anastomy patients with distal canicular obstruction they reported that 78.7% no epipura after removal of 3 months intubation in external lacrosistor with canicular obstruction a study reported on does the timing of silicon tube removal following external lacrosistor anastomy affects patient symptom uh, they divided in three groups uh, one is early group another is routine group and late group early group they removed the tube at one month of surgery a routine or a standard uh, is uh, less than two months of surgery and late removal uh, up to two months up to four months of surgery uh, they reported uh, late uh, removal uh, provides better outcome another study done by ben limbo et al uh, in nepal they report uh, they their study on results of early versus standard silicon stent removal following external lacrosistor anastomy under local anesthesia they reported that uh, success rate 97% in 2 weeks after 2 weeks of surgery and 98.6% uh, at 6 weeks of surgery so there is no significant difference between early and standard uh, uh, time of uh, removal of silicon tube uh, intubation we may use my mitosis c in dacrosistor rhinostomy surgery uh, for, i usually prefer for redesert cases and younger patient in summary local anesthesia with intravenous sedation with cardiac monitoring uh, our uh, preferred option i prefer curve j shaped uh, incision and with minimal manipulating tissue during surgery always respect blood vessel if hemorrhage occur don't pajol creating a large bony ostium is helpful for better outcome uh, and to suspended a uh, flap also helps for better outcome of external tissue surgery silicon intubation is mandatory for canicular stenosis fibrous sac uh, oculofacial trauma cases and also for younger age group removal of uh, intubation at 6 weeks of surgery thank you all uh, thank you thank you very much dr kadir uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Kadir. That was excellent presentation, and we are glad to learn so many uh, useful tips and tricks for the external DCR from you. Now, I would like to request our panelist, Professor Dr. Rohit Saiju, to put forward a few comments uh, on Dr. Kadir's talk. Thank you very much, Sabine, and thank you, Dr. Kadir, for nice presentation. And every actual plastic surgeon should learn how to do good. DCR surgery because this is the bread and butter for most of us and in our part of there are many DCR cases in this region so this will be very beneficial for especially the beginners as big crowd in today's participants are beginners are there so we are doing the DCR but how to improve the skill of DCR by taking care of every steps from the beginning like selection of the patient and you know what is the what is the anesthesia you would like to give for your patient? It depends and it prefer of the surgeon. We have surgeons who are doing endoscopy DCR under local anesthesia very successfully. And they are making their own way to change the trends. What we teach them, they are doing new teaching technique for others. And first of all, we have to know that which one is the good sac and which one is the bad lacrimal sac. The good one is that where lacrimal sac pressure will give the mucopurulent reflux. Good sac is that which is having the mucosil or sac having the dacrolith or hypertrophic sac because you can fashion the flaps very easily. There is a lot of tissue to handle and manipulate them. And which one is the bad sac? Those sacs which are having the fibrotic changes sequelae of the long-standing inflammation giving the very limited manipulation tissue. 
So for the fibrotic sac or the bad sac, what I would like to term that you can push viscoelastic borrow from the cataract set and push the viscoelastic with the syringing cannula and indent that, distend that, and it will make easy to fashion the sac. So this is the sum of the supplementary on the Dr. Kadi's presentation. Another is the surgical landmarks, we have to know that. So landmarks during the surgery are the middle canthal tendon, which we have to disinsert, anterior lacrimal crest and lacrimal sac fossa. To expose the entire lacrimal sac, we have to disinsert the middle canthal tendon and we give the vertical incision to expose entire length of the sac from the fundus to the neck of the sac to prevent from the SUM syndrome and make a successful outcome. So bony outcome, as you said that I'm very much agree that it should be large enough and it should be properly localized inferior and posteriorly. And in the, at the end of the surgery, it is recommended that to do the syringing on the table. So we are not doing regularly, but recommended that it will make that the, your new created passage is patent and it will make no tear for your passion in the future and for yourself also and make the successful DCR surgery. And regarding the skin incision, I would say that we use the knife only to cut the skin and subcuticle fascia. Then we keep away from the surgical field that rest of the tissue, we do the blunt dissection with the stiff incisors. We do not cut auricularis oculi muscle, which will make excessive bleeding, scarring, and difficulty in the performing in this uh, further steps of the surgery if you cut the auricularis. So better to just blunt dissect with the Steven season and go toward the periosteum and then expose first anatomical structure, a landmark that is middle canthal tendon will be in front of you and you disinsert that and then anterior lacrimal crest will be visible very clearly and the lacrimal sac fossa as well. The, along the periosteum, you will move the entire lacrimal sac away from the lacrimal sac fossa. So uh, this is very clear that if you do meticulous surgery with bloodless field and every step of the surgery done carefully, the surgical outcome is always good. At least I would like to say most of the time it is good. Regarding the stent using, we have done study in 2009 and published in BGO. In 100 patients, 44 with intubation and 56 without intubation gave the almost similar result with a successful rate of the 90%. So it is still the debate in the big conferences also intubation. There are very specific indication for the indication uh, intubation like in the redo DCR or nasal duct obstruction due to the trauma or the canonical stenosis accompanying with the nasal duct obstruction are the clear indication for intubation. So these are the some of the tips I would like to supplementally add it to the Dr. Mehboob's presentation. Otherwise, everything has explained very nicely and very beautifully and especially beginners should learn the, all the key steps to do very gently knowing the clear anatomy and meticulously to perform the DCR. Don't go for the time, don't go for the speed up your surgery time. You do the things in the good way. Don't count the time, count for the result. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Saiju, for that uh, wonderful tips that will surely come handy during our clinical practice. Uh, next, I would like to uh, move on with our session and I would like to invite our next speaker. Next speaker, Dr. Akshay Nair from India. Yeah. Dr. Nair is a director of Department of Oculoplastic Surgery and Ocular Oncology in Adi Tejot Eye Hospital, Mumbai. He is consultant of Thalbic Plastic Surgeon, Advanced Eye Hospital and Institute, Nabi Mumbai, and also honorary faculty of Lokmanya Tilak Municipal Medical College and General Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Nair has more than 100 PubMed or Medline Index peer reviewed publications, have written 16 book chapters, and serves as a reviewer for uh, multiple journals. 
Dr. Nair has received numerous prestigious awards, including Best Poster Award, International Ophthalmologist Education Award, and Achievement Award from American Academy of Ophthalmology, and Achievement Award from Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology as well. Dr. Nair, we are very glad to have you here and are excited to listen to your talk. The screen is now yours, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I just needed to know if I can. Uh, my other device has not been made a host. Can that be done oh, so I can share yeah, my screen? Sure, sure. Uh, so what is the name of your device? Sir? It's Akshay Nair iPad. Uh, it's done. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful uh, introduction. I'm honored and humbled to be in the presence of such giants in uh, oculoplastic surgery. And I will now share my screen. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about revision DCR and the assessment and surgery. Uh, in, in And I think a lot of what has been uh, uh, spoken has made my job easier because how to do a right DCR is already been explained, whether it's endoscopic, non-endoscopic, endonasal non-endoscopic or an external DCR. And if you've done all the steps that has been described, there's a good chance that you won't end up having to do a revision DCR. Well, at least not your own revision DCR. Uh, it's, it's good to see familiar faces. This is uh, three of us who are here already on this webinar. Uh, the last time flights were allowed and we could travel. That's uh, Natarut and that's Ben in the center and me where we were uh, again discuss on a lacrimal symposium in Cambodia uh, at a time when travel was still allowed. Uh, so like Dr. Uh, Rohit Saju said, DCR is the bread and butter for most of us. It is in many ways, in many, in, in, in many countries, in many uh, you know, uh, situations considered to be the gold standard for surgical correction of nasolacrimal duct obstruction. And it is one of the most commonest surgeries. How common it is, you know, you can see, a second. Almost 23% uh, of all lacrimal surgeries, all, all oculoplastic surgeries being done were uh, lacrimal surgery. So when almost a quarter of all oculoplastic surgeries that a specialist done, does is uh, lacrimal, primarily DCR, you can imagine how, what is the impact of having to have a good success rate. The reported success rates tend to be lesser. And also, you know, um, in many cases, there is a concept of functional epiphora, which also contributes to how anatomical success varies from surgical success. Uh, DCR does have a learning curve. So as you improve, so does your success rate till about 95% is what is the maximum success rate reported in literature. So when we look at what can cause uh, failure and we look at external DCR, we see that most common cause is an intranasal adhesion here, followed by adhesions to the middle turbinate and cicatricial lacrimal ostium scarring. But in most cases, it is more than one cause that combines to cause a DCR failure. So it's, ne it's rarely one. And you, as you can see, in almost 75% of the cases, this was a paper of review by Lynn and colleagues where they saw in most cases, there is at least a couple of things that have gone wrong that has contributed to failure. Similarly, LVPI, which uh, arguably has, uh, does one of the largest number of lacrimal surgeons in the in surgeries in the Indian subcontinent, Again, their series of failure, failed cases, osteal cicatricial closure, 50% of the cases, followed by common canalical or obstruction, intranasal sinicae, and osteum stenosis. So uh, anatomical failure causes have, have all more or less been the same across all series wherever they've analyzed. And it's important to know this. Why does a DCR fail? Because only when you know why has a... Is it failed? Can you go in and correct it appropriately? So things that you'd want to know before deciding to go in for operating is what is the duration since DCR? What are the chief complaints? What are your irrigation findings? Whether in, you know, you, you may assume that there is watering and there is a DCR being done, but without doing irrigation, you wouldn't be able to differentiate from a common canalicular obstruction or a canalicular obstruction from an osteal obstruction. Uh, 
And it is here that endoscopic findings are very important. Now, with an endoscope, if you go in, you're most, most likely able to visualize the ostium and know exactly what has gone wrong and exactly correct that particular pathology. Also, you need to realistically counsel the patients uh, about their success rates following a DCR. Uh, and, and only once you've done all the above steps, are you then, can you, you know, safely go ahead with the surgery? Uh, so endoscopic findings that you can see that here there's a cicatricial closure. It's become a small ostium. Here, this is a patent ostium with fluorescein seen at the, at, at the opening. Here again, there is just scar tissue being seen. So you can figure out what went wrong. And also you can see this is a very high ostium. So you know where, what could have gone wrong. Now I'm going to uh, share my video over here. So this is, a, these are cases of revision DCR. So I prefer to take an incision over the previous scar. Subcutaneous dissection in the plane where the previous scar has been made. Then we are palpating for the bone so that we know the extent of the previous obstetric. <laughs> the bone there. And once the bone is exposed, descend downwards towards the side of the ostium. Exactly where you can find it. So here you can see this is the part of the extent of the bone. And below that you have the flaps which are going underneath the edge of the ostium. So all the bone about that needs to be excised. That's the bone that needs to be removed such that you can make flesh because of flaps. So as you would for a regular extension, insert uh, uh, you know, the punch gradually enlarge the bony ostium in all directions. Again, you need to have bony clearance above the level of Common canaliculus. The bone in front of the common canaliculus has to be removed. Once you have exposed a sufficiently large area of nasal mucus, which primarily can serve as a good of material for creating the flaps, here you can then open up the card flaps. Typically, in this case, when there is osteal, osteum scarring. bicanalicular silicon intubation and then I suture the flaps like we normally would do for any standard external DCR. Regarding mitomycin C, there are a lot of uh, you know studies in revision endoscopic DCR. There is evidence to show that uh, mitomycin C may improve the outcome. Even in, uh, in other series, it has shown the same. And in general, in meta-analysis that have analyzed mitomycin C in endoscopic and external, the evidence seems to suggest that using mitomycin C can reduce the closure rate. But how much and when? So there have been multiple papers. Most of them have been led by Javed Ali and his team. So what they found is that they took mitomycin C at different concentrations, 0.2 milligram, 0.1 milligram per ml, 0.2 milligram per ml, 0.3, right up to 0.5. And they used in uh, used them in uh, human nasal mucosal fibroblast cells, cultures. 
and saw the optimal duration where uh, cell growth is inhibited without causing cell death or apoptosis. And it was found that the ideal duration was 0 0.2 milligram per ml, the concentration for three minutes. Anything more than that causes cell death and anything less than that is ineffective. So 0.2 mg per ml or 0.02% application for three minutes, I typically don't uh, end up having to you know, do a wash of the area, allow the mitomycin seed to be soaked in and taken in. There's also another technique of circumosteal mitomycin C, especially if you're doing an endoscopic DCR, where mitomycin C at the same concentration that was mentioned is injected into the mucosa at these sites, four sites around the uh, edges of the mucosa, mucosa the, on four sides. And they found that even long-term results are very good and it helps in preventing cicatricial closure. So, uh, the next thing that we need to think about is intubation. What, how does intubation really help? Now, Professor Havati very well said that as, as a safety net, you know, because you never know when, which patients may end up developing canalicular trauma or canalicular stenosis or obstruction or even osteal closure, having a stent in place allows and make sure that there will be an anatomically patent opening uh, through the uh, area under the flaps. And that is what literature also says. But there's also another, another school of thought which, which the Professor Selva's paper very well describes. This is selective intubation. Every case doesn't need to be intubated, but choose the cases where you need to intubate because those are the, and those cases typically are cases with definite uh, in cases where there have been multiple episodes of previous acute dacrocystitis, which results in a small contracted shriveled flap, which may be inadequate. Uh, or a revision surgery, which is why I prefer to use intubation revision surgery, excessive bleeding, cases of inflammatory disorders, and small sacs. Now, these are indications where you would want to use it because uh, in every case, it may not really be needed. Now, how long would you want to keep the, uh, uh, the stent in place? Now, that, this is another paper that sees that has looked at the growth or the size of the ostium after surgery. And it says that any, by any contraction that has to happen, happens in the first four weeks. Beyond four weeks to so up to two years, there is no change in the size of the ostium post DCR, which means that typically any duration beyond four weeks, having a stent in place doesn't really help. If anything, it can be a source of infection or possibly develop what is now growing to a separate science, biofilms. So you don't want to help, you know, you don't want to end up having the patient suffer more because of a stent that you've left in place for a longer duration. So in summary, my go-to surgery for a, a revision case is an external DCR. While I'm confident of primary endo endoscopic DCRs, my learning curve is still a little bit, uh, uh, you know, lagging in terms of revision cases for endoscopic DCR and also, uh, but I do make sure that I put in an endoscope to identify the cause before going up and taking up the surgery. If you've seen that there is an intranasal adhesion, then you know that that needs to be addressed and you possibly don't need to go in and do a completely new flap creation. Use of mitomycin C and stents in revision cases helps in improving your success rates. However, you need to counsel your patients about the potential need for multiple surgeries. And at the end of the day, if you've done your sur primary surgeries well, then you know, prevention is better than cure. You'd rarely end up having to see your own cases being you know, failing. But if you've, if you've done a good case, a primary DCR well, and still comes up as a failure to you, those are the best cases to learn on because you know, you know exactly what you've done and you know then how the body reacts to these surgeries and what you, how you can modify your technique as time goes along. With that, I'll uh, you know, end my talk. And if there are any questions or discussion from the panel, I'll be happy to uh, contribute. Um, thank you, Dr. Nair. Uh, management of failed DCR could be a challenging job and you explained it so well. Thank you so much. Now I would like to request Dr. Nath out for his valuable comments on this. Hello. Hi, Ashay. How are you? Thanks for very good. I'm good, Jeff. How are you? Hi, nice to meet you, man. And I have a few questions to ask you. Um, in previously, I have a couple of kids that they have the difficult time to do the surgery, even though they have a failed fail DCR a few times after the previous surgery, and including me also. 
And I have tried to use a, a MMC, but still have the fail case. And uh, still have the failure from the MMC. If you have tried MMC for two times and still fail, what would you, what is the, the way to approach? I, I mean, the, the, the step to approach. How, how would you think this one should go to the external DCR revision or this endo DCR revision? And how would you evaluate before the operation or intraoperatively that how to concern and factor of the scar tissue or the bone tissue? How, how would you uh, uh, evaluate right. that? Please. I think that's a great question because many times we end up seeing patients who've been operated twice, thrice, may not be at our own centers, but you know they've had multiple interventions and watering is an issue for them. So uh, at many places, they know previously multiple operated cases are directly relegated to a dacryocystectomy, but that really doesn't solve the patient's problem because the patient's problem is watering. And when you do a dacryocystectomy, the patient is still going to have watering. So I, I very much agree with you that a DCR still should be planned. If there are multiple failures, I would then go in, most certainly go in for an external DCR, uh, because in that case, if we need to make bigger flaps, we need to remove more circumosteal bone such that more nasal mucosa is available. Typically, I found that the more the number of DCRs are being done, the lesser lacrimal sac tissue is available to make the flaps. And in cases where there are, where sometimes there is absolutely no lacrimal sac tissue available, I've even had to suture the lacrimal, the nasal mucosal flap to the edge of the orbicularis that overhangs the ostium such that there is at least some sort of mucosal lining on one side. Uh, I would still go ahead with mitomycin C because the purpose of mitomycin C is to make sure that the fibroblasts at the edge of the mucosa do not multiply at a high rate and such that the scar tissue doesn't grow on all sides from the ostium and the ostium remains patent. So whether it's a second time or a third time, I would still use mitomycin C and I would still put a tube. Uh, but these are the kind of cases where I'll probably want to leave the tube a little longer, maybe six weeks, and then uh, take care of them. Right. And I have a quite uh, another question. If you have the failed case that uh, the cause that from the previous surgery by the external DCR and the failed case from the endo DCR, have you found any different for the uh, the 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 the, uh, the anatomical uh, abnormal uh, from to approach uh, to make the cause yeah. of failure? Right. Uh, actually, yes, because what we've seen is that in patients who have undergone a previous external DCR, the amount of bone that has been removed tends to be much more and much wider compared to the bony ostiums of endoscopic DCRs. Because in endoscopic DCRs, you know, the aim is to create a bony ostium that completely opens up the sac and the sac is visualized. But in an external DCR, the sac is on the opposite side of the osteotomy. So your aim is to make a large nasal mucosal flap so that you obviously end up making a larger flap. So that's one major anatomical difference that I've seen in endoscopic versus uh, primary DCRs when they come up for revision. Right. And in the case that have the failure and you have been, you have proved that they have a really big scar tissue. I think I would say about four or five millimeter uh, thickness of the scar tissue tissue at the common canalicula area. What would you approach? But what is the technique that you're going to overcome this one? Right. So if there is a big scar tissue at the common canalicular opening, right. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. so in many cases, you just have to end up removing that scar tissue and try to create a big nasal mucosal flap that overhangs that. Uh, I am now, you know, I have a colleague who's, who's exceptionally good in CDCRs. Conjunctivus DCRs is not my speciality. I have little or no experience with it, but he's someone who's trained with Raman Malhotra uh, and he's very comfortable with it. So in cases where I know there's a common canalicular block, I would you know, uh, encourage people to explore the option of a CDCR as well. Uh, you know, As long as you have access to a good quality Lester Jones tube and the patient is compliant and is, is promising to take care of it, that is also an option for us. Yeah. 
And another question, please. Um, we are all the lacrimo surgeon. We have done a lot of the lacrimo surgery. Many, many times that after uh, the patient have a significant uh, cheering, significant epiphora before the surgery. And we have done very good uh, DCR. And after the surgery, we uh, are linking 100% flow, but the patient still have a lot of cheering. 20 years ago, no one talked about the myeloma and gland dysfunction. No one talked about the ocular surface disease. But we are eyelid surgeons. We are lacrimal surgeons. I think we have found and confessed a lot of the uh, myeloma and gland dysfunction, blepharitis, ocular surface that leading to the functional problem and uh, if pseudo before or fun, uh, cheering after the lacrimal surgery. Uh, please uh, uh, tell us about your approach and how to you manage uh, the people that have uh, a good syringing and a fulfills of the cheering after the good lacrimal surgery, please. Yeah, I think that's a it's a, it's a great uh, question, and uh, you know, I, Jeff, I want to tell you, you should answer that. Yours, you know, you you probably have probably have more experience, but yeah, uh, you know, many times we've end up done doing a very good DCR, but the patient still has. Uh, has patent syringing. And I think that's where we need to look beyond the lacrimal system, like you rightly said. Have a look at the punctum. Does it really oppose the globe? Look at the meibomian orifices. Is, is that okay? What about the tear breakup time? Is there dry eye? Lid laxity? How is the lid closure? Uh, sometimes, you know, many times a lid tightening procedure helps in uh, improving the blink and improving the, 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 the lacrimal pump mechanism, whatever little is left of it after the DCR. So we need to explore all of these. And uh, there's also this paper that, that's uh, spoken about uh, uh, um, silicon intubation for the treatment of, uh, you know, functional epiphora. Uh, if I can just quickly share my screen again, it's, it's from AP, uh, OPRS journal. Uh, yeah, here it is. So silicon intubation for the treatment of epiphora in adults with presumed functional nasolacrimal duct obstruction. So these are patients who've either had, uh, and I'll be happy to share the link of this paper as well. So these are patients who've had either a DCR or are patients who have a patent mm -hmm. syringing but still have constant epiphora. And in these patients, uh, there is no other lid pathology that also matches. So these are patients who the surgeons have gone in and put in a plain silicone intubation, either through the ostium or through the nasolacrimal duct opening. And in that itself, in many cases, has helped them. So that's another option that we could explore. But I would rule out every lid and surface pathology before going in for any sort of surgery. Remember, these people have already had an anatomically successful surgery. Right. And for, for the people that have the SUM syndrome, um, could you deal with the SUM syndrome with the external DCR? No, for SUM syndrome, I prefer to go endoscopically because you know you can just enlarge the opening and, and that usually helps with mucosa to mucosa opposition. Right, thank you very much. Very good Hi, oh, Hi Ochi, yeah, this, nice this, to have this you felt here. Yeah, Dr. Roy, this felt like yeah. an examination viva, you know, a professor asking a student the questions. Right. Hello, Ache, nice to have you here and thank you for agreeing to be part of Nessus webinar. My thank pleasure. you for your great video. Just uh, during the video time, I found that your playback music was louder than your voice. So it is a little bit... I know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry about that. that. Uh, I have a question to you, Ache, that uh, did you find the multiple failure DCR to be repaired where there is no absolutely uh, lacrimal sac tissue. And as you said that, you suture the nasal mucosa to, to the orbiculars. Does it work properly? I'm, I have no idea about that. And do you have experience yeah. on the uh, harvesting graft from other tissue and making the uh, lacrimal sac flap? Yeah. Right, so actually, uh, doc, I think Dr. Kasuri Bhattacharya from Guwahati in India, She's uh, presented a series uh, or a couple of cases where they've harvested and a couple of other places, papers also have been have spoken about mucous membrane harvesting from the buccal mucosa where they've used that uh, double-sided mucous membrane and sutured that to the orbicularis because orbicularis is a vascular structure and that serves as the lacrimal sac mucosa and then sutured that to the nasal uh, mucosa. Uh, 
that could serve as a surrogate but i think at the end of it what we are looking for is anatomical apposition between the common canalicular opening into the nose and as long as we can make sure this happens uh, either by suturing the nasal mucosal flap to the orbicularis and having the tubes in place and hoping that the tubes stay there to prevent fibrous growth around the diameter of the tubes it, it, it's it, it may help at the end of the day you know having no lacrimal sac you know you're in a corner it's a cry for help and we at that time are just doing whatever we can to try to help the patient thank you thank you acha question to the uh, gof uh, did not out but you, you don't feel that in multiple failure dcr do you refer to uh, other colleagues who are doing external dcr because the exposure will be much better where the scar tissue is much much bigger or you try to do yourself with the endoscopic approach so he you ask me yeah yeah i'm asking you <laughs> sorry sorry for the multiple failure cases where the lots of scarring is there you don't think that you could uh, i mean they refer the cases to the expert, external dcr experts to manage uh, that oh no no And how is your success rate in those um, in my life cases? The, yeah? the most the most number that i have the why is about five times but i i i will recommend for the the beginner or the junior lacrimal surgeon if you have fail fail there from the your own dcr please try to revise by yourself is try to use the endoscopic for revision and do record that for the uh, video of the surgery every every lacrimal surgery every sort kind of surgery that you have done please do record and then bring the video back and review the surgery and you will learn what you have done and you learn by the mistake and you will learn the principle you will learn the mechanism of the problem and you learn how to solve the problem i think this one is the best way to learn and if you have the failure please please reflect by yourself and you you will learn a lot by that point and i personally i I, I try to use the endoscope, and even though the patient have the fell, even though from the thick bone or the scar tissue or the cannulation, you can you can do revision, even though the minor or the major revision, and you can fix that. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Nair, Doctor uh, Nathod, and Doctor Professor Saizu. We have had a very nice discussion. So, uh, moving on to the next presenter, we have. Uh, Dr. Ashish Rasponta. He will be presenting on the results of national DCR survey and the need of national DCR protocol. So, uh, Dr. Ashish is a consultant cataract and oculofacial plastic surgeon. Uh, in the department of oculofacial plastic surgery michai hospital nepal he is the executive member of nessus and life member of episodes he is the editor of nessus e magazine and section editor of nepal journal of ophthalmology uh, he completed his um, md ophthalmology from bp kolera institute of health science in tehran and his fellowship from fellowship in oculoplasty from tilganga institute of ophthalmology he has completed his clinical ophthalmology from university of edinburgh uk under the prestigious david and molly bayed foundation scholarship he has presented at national and international conferences such as ocular plastic association of india european society of ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgeon asia pacific academy of ophthalmology and world ophthalmology conference he has multiple publications in national and international peer reviewed journals so now the screen is yours dr ashish Dr. Ashish. Thank you, Dr. Nisa. Hello and good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Ashish Raspan, uh, ocular plastic surgeon and cataract surgeon from Mechi Eye Hospital, Jhapa, Nepal. And I'll be presenting on results of national DCR survey and the need for national DCR protocol. It was a survey of DCR practice patterns among the ophthalmologists of Nepal. So why was a survey like this needed? The surgical management of dacryl cystitis has progressed by leaps and bounds over the years. It dates back nearly 2000 years back and endoscopic approach was described by Calwell in 1893, external DCR which is considered gold standard described by Totti in 
McDonough and Meering explained the first endoscopic transnasal DCR in 1989, and the new frontiers in the line, laser-assisted DCR and microendoscopic transcanonicular DCR are already there. Yet, there are innumerable variations in techniques and choices. For example, the choice of external DCR, endoscopic DCR, conjunctival DCR, the appropriate preoperative investigations, preoperative medications, local anesthesia versus general anesthesia, use of cautery and suction devices, anterior and posterior lap, flap suturing, lacrimal tubes versus no tubes, duration of tubes, wound infection rate, and success rate. So this creates a lot of confusion for the beginners. The factors for variability in techniques can be surgeon related like training or school, skills and comfort zone, availability of resources and cost of setup. Whereas it can also be patient related like age, comorbidities, economy, cosmesis and pain threshold. So the survey was needed as there were no studies observing practice patterns of this year in Nepal. And it was done to know if there are variability in practice patterns among ophthalmologists of Nepal regarding DCR surgery. If there is a difference, this would help to establish DCR protocols based on the current evidence and help for the uniform best results throughout the country. So how we did it? It was a cross-sectional study with Google form based questionnaire, which included 39 questions and was sent to the ophthalmologists of Nepal Ophthalmic Society via email, responded information, pre-operative, intra-operative, and post-operative outcomes, and all other outcome-related questions were asked. Institutional Review Board clearance was obtained from Nepal Health Research Council, and all registered ophthalmologists in Nepal were invited to participate in the study, which was 300. Analysis was done, and categorical variables were reported with counts and percentages. So what were our findings? Out of the 300 ophthalmologists invited to participate in the survey, 55% responded, thus the sample size was 165. 61% of them performed DCT, and 66% of the respondents, that is 89 respondents, performed DCR regularly. Out of them, majority were from Bagmati province, followed by province 1 and province 5. Notably, there were no DCR surgeons in Karnali province. DCR was also performed by general ophthalmologists and other subspecialties. This was the gender distribution. Nearly 70% of the DCR surgeons, that is 62 respondents out of 89 who performed surgery, DCR surgery, were the, from younger age group, that is 30 to 40 years of age. More than half of the surgeons had experience of one to five years for DCR surgery. And most of them performed one to 10 cases in a month, that is 63 respondents out of 89. And only there were three uh, respondents who performed more than 50 cases per month. Most of them, um, half of the, uh, sorry. More than 85% of the DCR surgeons preferred preoperative uh, pre -operative syringing probing and sac pressure test with 46 of them uh, doing both all the three, syringing, probing, and sac pressure test, whereas 26 of them doing syringing and probing only. And 85.4% of the DCR performing surgeons preferred ENT consultation prior to surgery. Injection diclofenac was used by one third of the DCR surgeons as preoperative analgesia, whereas 26 of them did not prefer any uh, preoperative anesthesia. Other anest analgesics used were injection pethidine and injection tramadol. Most of the external DCR surgeons prefer local anesthesia for their surgery. And half of the endoscopic DCR surgeons prefer local anesthesia, whereas uh, one respondent resp using both, probably local anesthesia with added anesthesia. The illumination sources were surgical headlight, wall-mounted light, and standing light for all. And uh, only two respondents responded using surgical microscope for the external DCR. Most of the respondents did not use uh, cautery and suction machine for their routine cases. And preservation of posterior lacrimal and nasal mucosa was done by 63% of the respondents. Only 3% of the respondents used intraoperative mitomycin C for their primary uh, tachyrysostatis cases. 
55% of the respondents used silicon tube or lacrimal tube for routine external odisha, whereas 45% of the respondents did not use uh, silicon tube for the external DCR. And the duration of tube in external DCR was varied according to the surgeons. Uh, nearly one third preferred four to six weeks, other third preferred six to eight weeks, and other third preferring three months. So there was a lot of variability in the duration of tube. Uh, coming to the duration of tube in endoscopic DCR, five of the surgeons uh, doing endoscopic DCR preferred to keep it for three months. Majority of the surgeons did not prefer any intraocular surgery while the tube was in situ and they deferred it till the tube was removed. Now, this is probably a very good highlight for the scenario in our, in our country. External DCR was performed by uh, 88 respondents and uh, we can see that only 11 respondents performed endoscopic DCR. So as stated by Dr. Basant Rasama, probably we need to expand the horizon for endoscopic DCR learning. And the success rate of external DCR was mentioned by more than 90% of the respondents as more than 75%. And the rate of post-operative wound infection was mentioned as less than 1% by majority of the surgeons. So this leads to a question, okay, there is a variability in practice pattern. So what is the problem? After all, different techniques work differently for different surgeons. However, we need to ensure that we need to be guided by the evidence-based practices. Inferior techniques may be handed over during the teaching learning process, if not updated. And our ultimate aim should be to ensure best possible management for our patients. So what is the solution? An evidence-based DCR surgical protocol and disseminating the, this protocol findings through workshops on DCR surgery should be the answer. We need to ensure that there is common consensus, uniform standard of practice, and evidence-based best management practices for our patients. We should act. It should be Nepali Society of Oculoplasty Surgeons, NESOS, and Nepal Ophthalmic Society. And when to act now? Obviously, it is now. The best time is now. And I would like to acknowledge all the participant ophthalmologists of the survey, members of the DCR survey study group, Nepali Society for Oculoplasty Surgeons, and Dr. Humbadu Guru for their support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashis. Uh, it was a great statistics there. So now uh, I move on to request Dr. Sulakshmi Kotwal for the comments on this talk. Thanks to the organizing committee for giving this opportunity. It's a good presentation and very nicely, beautifully presented by Dr. Ashis. Thank you, Ashish. And here I noticed uh, that only nine ophthalmologists are doing external this year uh, in their early ophthalmological career. Uh, that is, uh, it is shown that only one, within one year. So um, uh, it's, uh, we have to increase the number of ophthalmologists who are, um, who are able to uh, independent uh, uh, doing external this year. Um, for that, uh, um, we have to encourage the uh, resident student uh, in their um, practice. Um, and we should uh, um, skill transform to the uh, external DCR is mandatory like uh, cataract surgery because uh, in some situation, uh, because uh, so the important thing is that the, in each and every part of the body, in every situation, in every hospital, uh, in oculoplastic surgeon could not be risked to provide this service. That's why in some, uh, sometimes uh, in some situation we need that, uh, without uh, DCR surgery we can, or DCT surgery, we cannot do the cataract surgery. So it's important to transfer the skills uh, during that period. Um, and uh, and uh, at, the, uh, at the end, I would uh, ultimately um, um, agreed with the study that making the protocol, you know, stand, standard protocol um, uh, for making that st standard pro protocol, it's time to 
time to um, not to be late uh, to make it and uh, uh, to give everyone every uh, to, to the, uh, the external DCR in our situation like Nepal. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Say no. Thank you, ma'am. So now uh, with this, we have come to our last talk of the day. I would like to welcome Dr. Prerna Arjar Kafre for the next talk, which is on canalicular trauma. Uh, Dr. Prerna is a consultant ophthalmologist and head of oculoplasty department in Biratnagarai Hospital. Uh, she is an executive member of NIP, uh, NESOS. She is a life member of Nepal Ophthalmic Society and NIPRI, uh, NIPRIS of Oculoplastic Society. Uh, she is a life member and joint treasurer of Oculoplastic Society of South Asia. She has completed her MD ophthalmology from BP Koyala Institute of Health Sciences, Tehran, and a fellowship in orbit and oculoplasty from Op Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology. She has multiple publications in national and international journals and has presented at various national and international conferences. She's the recipient of BOPP, BOPSS International Visiting Fellow Award 2019 and a recipient of Korean Ophthalmic Society Travel Grant in 2019. So please proceed, Dr. Prerna. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nisha, for the introduction. Uh, today, good, good evening, everyone. Today, uh, I'm talking amidst all this DCR things. Uh, I'm going to talk about the canalicular trauma, which is uh, quite interesting for all of us. So we all know canalicular trauma, it refers to the sudden physical injury that results in lacrimal drainage system damage. And it is relatively common, approximately 16% of all eyelid laceration accounts for canalicular trauma and various methods of repair, choice of stents, timing of surgery and complexity of the structure involved always makes it a special surgical procedure for us. And we all know about the surgical anatomy, the two millimeter of the vertical part of the canaliculus and eight millimeter of the horizontal part, along with its complexity when the anterior and posterior horns of the medial cantal tendon that play around the lacrimal sac to fuse with the periosteum of the anterior and posterior lacrimal crest respectively. And this comes in account when we are doing the repair. When we see the mechanism of the trauma, the damage occurs after a direct or indirect injury to the eyelid orbit or periorbital region. The medial lacrimal portion of the eyelid, we all know it's devoid of tarsus and surrounding connective tissue. And this makes it vulnerable and the weakest portion. So any blunt tan tan tangential eyelid or cheek blows causes indirect canalicular laceration. There are three kinds of avulsion we can see, which depends upon the sharp or a blunt forces. Number one is abrupt canalicular. The second one is abrupt total disinsertion of the eyelid from the medial canthal plane. And third is the biplane avulsion in which uh, externally it is a small laceration, but deep down the laceration is quite uh, big. So laceration of the inferior canaliculus uh, is more common than the superior one. And it be becomes more important to us because we all know the contribution of the tear, tear drainage by the inferior canaliculus range from 55 to 64% in total, while from the superior canaliculus, it is 35 to 56%. Before coming to the management, uh, the materials that is used to repair, it has been evolved through years since 1913, from thick hair to rubber or bone, to silk thread, cat guard, malleable rod, to the recent periods of the silicon stents. In our experience at Biratnagarai Hospital in the last five years, out of 255 lead repair, more than 60 uh, of them were canalicular repair, which accounts for about, around 23.5%. And we have seen that uh, most of the children are under two years of age. Is the trauma is always almost uh, due to the blouse hook while uh, breastfeeding. And the older children and adults are mainly due to blunt trauma due to various objects like wood logs, RTA, fist, and we have encountered a few with dog bites and beer bites also. So how to manage? It, all, it is a great challenge for us and timely and meticulous repair of canalicular injury, it forms the basis for a successful outcome. We can experience a frustrating time 
while exploring an injured canaliculus, especially when injury occurs deep within the medial canthal complex, close, close to the lacrimal sac. So the tips for uh, laceration repairs are, we, there are a few rules. The number one is always rule out the multiple or, or occult injuries or other life-threatening problems by evaluating and confirming the ABC. Perform a complete eye examination before the repair. If any full thickness eyelid injury, we have to be sure to check for globe perforation. And if it is there, repair the perforation first. Retrobulbar hemorrhage, emphysema, and orbital fractures may be present, so it should be keep, kept in mind and accounted. We should try to preserve the eyelid tissue as much as possible because high vascularity often allows for viable reapproximation. The wound inspection should be done nicely and copious irrigation and exploration with removal of any foreign material should be done. The presence of orbital fat, this rises the risk of deeper injury in foreign bodies, so she should not be looked out. And photograph of all preoperative injuries and immediate postoperative results should be kept because there can be a medical legal problem later on. Use of prophylactic antibiotics according to physician expertise and opinion and tetanus, tetanus prophylaxis should be always given. We should check the integrity of the tear outflow system. We should always keep in mind that blunt injury to the medial eyelid with resultant eyelid laceration almost always tears the canaliculus. And in eyelid laceration, medial to the puncta, the canaliculus should be probed to assess the integrity before taking up the surgery. So, and another main step is to identify the severe canaliculus, canalicular end and the injured distal canaliculus in the identification is always a, an enigma to us because it's very difficult to find. On the process of finding it, the great mimicker comes, that is the canthal tendon fibers that convincingly mimic the cuttings of the canalicular, canalicular mucosa during the exploration. And if we are not clear, careful with it, we may create a false passes. So how to proceed with all these steps? Uh, we should always know the several surgical maneuvers increase the likelihood of the finding the distant, distal canaliculus. We should minimize the risk of creating false passes that causes the further injury to the soft tissue. We should avoid the use of excess amount of local anesthetic infiltration. So G is always good. We should always clean the injury and look for the foreign bodies. The use of cotton tipped applicator for any exploration of the deeper soft tissue injury should be advocated. And use of tooth forcep and retractive should always be limited to skin, skin retraction alone. Because if you use it for the deeper tissue, that splaying and distortion of the medial canthal complex can occur and makes our job more difficult. We should always resist the temptation to pass a Bowman probe in an inpatient and haphazard fashion into soft tissue that looks like it may, might be the canaliculus. This will surely create a false passes. And severe canalicular N can also be found by injecting air or fluorescent dyed hyaluronic acid or non staining colored irrigate through the uninvolved canaliculus. And the repair should be done uh, of the, both the ends using the canalicular layer uh, stents in the layers and end to end or pericanalicular suturing should be done very meticulously. We keep the canalicular stent for six weeks to three months. Here we keep it for uh, three months at least. And we should always attempt to stent repositioning in case of the stent migration. So this is the picture of the canaliculus, which has got a long uh, silicone tube uh, and our vertical part with the, or another rounded uh, circular cholerate that is going to get uh, plugged in in our uh, punctum so that uh, uh, can it stent uh, repositioning, repositioning, repositioning should not be done later on. It, it will not get uh, too much of uh, coming out later on. And this is a small video. Sorry. It's not playing. Sorry, it's not playing. Okay, leave it. So take home message is already repair uh, is very crucial. Good illumination and magnification is 
always needed, and stains markedly improve the cosmetic as well as functional results. Even patients not patent to syringing are often asymptomatic if not well aligned. So these are my references, and at last, thank you all, uh, the NASA's executive committee, the management team and IT department of Viratnarai Hospital, Dr. Divahamal Lamichani for a long uh, uh, work together for all these years, Dr. Gaurav Dungana and Dr. Tripres Ras Pandi for the unconditional support. Thank you all. May I uh, go on with my video by sharing it in another form? Can I do that? Uh, actually, if it's it short, we can do it. Yeah, it is. Do we, are, we are already running short of time, that's why. Okay. And I'll try to make it as fast as possible. If, if possible, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, please. And let's see. Okay. So this is the video we are finding. Uh, let me start, I'm sorry for the delay. This is finding of the uh, proximal canalicular end, which is very easy. So putting on with the stent and fixing the stent collarate in the punctum, finding the uh, distal canaliculus and passing it into through the distal canaliculus to the lacrimal system and repairing it with layer, the posterior uh, end of the distal and proximal canalicular uh, to the posterior part and the anterior to anterior one, making it, uh, bring it in the approximation towards each other. It will fix our stent in position. Then pericanalicular peri repair, in layer should be done for a best result later on. And here the stent. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank for you very patients. much. Thank you, Dr. Prena, for that uh, wonderful and nice presentation. I would like to request our panelists, Dr. Ben, uh, for a few comments regarding this talk. Thank you, Sabin, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it was a really nice uh, work. Uh, that uh, Perna and their colleagues are doing at Biratnar Eye Hospital. It's, uh, it's a light moment for us. We're proud of your work. But at the same time, when it comes to a canalicular trauma, I always say to my fellows that uh, you cannot escape canalicular uh, trauma management without finding the distal aids. And you have no excuse that you can't find the digital aids. You have to find, uh, that's the minimum mandatory things that we need to do. And for that, I think for the successful finding of the digital end of the canaliculus is very important. Well, it can be divided as a proximal cut where it's very easy to find, as uh, you mentioned that proximal cuts are very easy to uh, find. Uh, no, no any special memory required. You can directly visualize the cut end and then you can do a peri canalicular repair. But at the same time, let me tell you one thing. In your video, I saw that you started uh, putting a peri, limbo, a peri canalicular suture from top towards the canaliculi. So I always advocate you need to pass the suture from inside and come outside. So similarly to the other cut end also, you have to put the needle inside the canaliculi and come out. That gives you much more control over peri canalicular repair. I think that's what I believe. Similarly, when you have a distal cut end, especially like you said that uh, below the mediocanthal tendon, if there is a detached at common canalicular area, that's a real challenge, but it doesn't mean that you won't find it. You will find it and you have to find it. So the simple maneuver in that particular situation is you have to tilt the head, see through the microscope, make the common canalicular 
area coaxial with a microscope. So that means you have to manipulate the head of the patient so that it align with the microscope. Okay? And in that place also, you need a good retractors. You need to have a good retractors all the time. And then carefully visualize the white patch among other red area, okay? Other are vascular area, which is red, but that particular area, which is a uh, caught end of uh, common canal plus, uh, the medial canthal tendon will appear as whitish area. So as soon as you visualize that area, you need to manipulate the surrounding tissue so that you can see an opening. It looks like a slit first, but as you manipulate with your retractors, you can see that beautiful hole. And then you can now pass your mini monoka, 40 millimeter mini monoka inside that, which will roll inside the sac and then it will stay inside the sac. I don't advocate to cut the mini monoka in smaller pieces because that sometimes will give inadequate assurance of anastomosis of canaliculi. I think these are some of the points, but of the most important thing that has to be mentioned when you do a canalicular repair is you need to start from posterior part. You need to first manage the posterior lamella, then pericanaliculi, then the anterior lamella. If you don't repair the posterior, uh, posterior lamella, then your mini monica will be extruded sometime from the back and it will come out and then you can see that extrusion there. So, or you may get a fistula formation from Kondanchara to Canada. So, for to prevent that, I think the important step is to close first posterior lamella, then the peri pericanalicula, and then into lamella. I think these are some of the tips that I can add to your presentation. Otherwise, you had done a beautiful job. Thank you uh, for presenting such a good presentation in this Thank you. Uh, sir. Thank you. Webinar. Sir, I have done that. What you have taught, uh, the posterior lamella was sutured first, but due to the video editing, it is become <laughs> looks like that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Dr. Ben, for that wonderful tips, which are which are always easier to say but difficult to difficult uh, art and skill to learn. And we are very glad to learn from your experience. Now. Uh, we move on to our next uh, session. There has been a lot of interest in today's webinar and we have almost 200 plus uh, live uh, audience in Zoom as well as YouTube live. And there are lots of questions to answer. And I would like to request my colleague, Dr. Tiptesh Pandey to, uh, to move on with our next session that is panel discussion session. Thank you very much. The screen is now yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Swabin and Dr. Nisa. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Audible. Yes, yes. I'm Dr. Triptis Raj Pandey, and I'm working as ocular plastic surgeon at Mechinetralaya in Japa. And the last session was really informative with lots of knowledge and experience of Padigraph. No wonder we have so many queries from our audiences. Uh, but uh, many of the things have already been discussed during the presentation session. So we have collected and sorted out the question, and only those questions will be entertained during these sessions. So I would like to request our distinguished panelists, speakers, to help us clarify the queries for our audiences. So without further delay, we'd like to start uh, the session with first question. And the first question is regarding uh, the endoscopic as well as non-endoscopic DCR surgery, where one of our audiences have uh, asked, what happens if we remove all the flaps, uh, uh, mucosal flaps and leave it raw, especially in the scenario where the mucosal flap creation is not satisfactory? And the role of adjunctive medicine in such cases, like the mitomycin C or triamcinolone injection in such cases. Uh, so I'd like to uh, uh, invite or ask our panelists to clarify on this topic. Not, Dr. Nata, would, would you like to answer that? It's, so you are not audible. That is sorry. muted. Dr. Nata, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, the question again, please. So we have seen uh, so many suture, uh, flap creation technique in your uh, presentation and also the suturing technique. But what uh, if, uh, if you are not able to fashion the flap creation satisfactorily? Or sometimes uh, if one, and one can uh, 
uh, take the option to remove all the flaps and leave the ostium raw. And whether is there any rule of injective medicine like metomycin C, uh, transgenal injection in such cases? Can we really remove all the flaps and just uh, leave the ostium open without uh, uh, leaving, without uh, creating any flap or suturing the flap? Mm, uh, that's the that's a that's a good question. Um, suppose the if the surgeon have have uh, done the surgery and remove the bone already and uh, the whole uh, lacrimal mucosa that not healthy and have been removed and you have got only the small stump of the common canaliculi. Um, my, my recommendation is um, I would try the first um, try to uh, put the surrounding nasal mucosa to approximate as much as possible and try to use a residual nasal mucosa to covering the bare bone because of if we leave the bare bone, that's gonna lead to the sickly intention healing. That's gonna be the a lot of sickle tissue scar. And second, I would use the the, the sickle bed or uh, 15 degree uh, blade that you use to do the uh, palacentesis to cut in maybe in the horizontal or the vertical uh, direction and cut the wall of losen muller and cut the scar on the common canaliculi and use the silicone stand um, as big as possible. I, but I would not uh, try to do double stand. I use the, they have the small stand and big, bigger stand. I try to use the bigger stand. And then I would use a gel foam to soak and the thick gel foam and, uh, and put to like a, a, like a tamponade the, the, and keep the surrounding nasal mucosa not come to the close to the common canaliculi. And I will inject some steroid and put some methylmycin C. And import, import, importantly, after the surgery, I will fill up the patient so often, maybe weekly on the first month and clean the nose and clean the nasal cord and avoid the granulation tissue. At the healing prostate on the first uh, two weeks, for a week or six weeks, very important. If any day, every week that I follow up and I have found that we can see um, the cicatrical tissue tissue started to encroaching to the common canaliculi. They can encroaching from the upper and the lower or the uh, front or the back part. Uh, then I would use a, a sickle to cut the uh, scar tissue uh, in every visit. I think at that point, we try to, uh, if any day that have the granulation tissue, we will suck the granulation tissue and cut the granulation tissue and some inject the steroid weekly, a minimal degree in the post-operatively. I think in this way, if we sacrifice the whole uh, lacrimal tissue and not adequate, I think this way we can, we can survive the, the patency of the nasal osteum. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your opinion. Uh, I'd like to ask any other panelist if uh, UFC has a different view on this topic. Yeah. Can I uh, comment on that? Yeah, sure, sir. Okay. Sure. Um, well, uh, if we will start with the, uh, you know, whether you are doing endonasal or you are doing external DCR, actually, we concentrate on the, what we call the pre-compartments. Um, in doing external DCR, or whether you are doing it uh, endonasally, you, the aim is uh, to eliminate the third compartment, and that is the uh, lacrimal sac. Okay, and in line with the, what we are discussing now, uh, there is actually, there's no flap that is created from the mucosa of the lacrimal sac because it's not healthy and there is no or sometimes uh, it's a cicatrice, or uh, perhaps uh, if you are doing it, the, uh, I mean, the repair of failed DCR endoscopically, or actually in what I have done in the past years when I was doing endoscopic endonasal DCR using the RF, actually I removed the, uh, you know, the flap. I do not create any formal mucosal flaps I remove the, uh, just like eliminating the sac, the, uh, actually the, 
that's already the, 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 the medial wall of the sac. And then I'm also not uh, creating any flaps. I'm removing also the nasal mucosa. So there is absent mucosal flaps and the, uh, the healing will be a secondary intention, not the primary intention, because if you sutured it or if you uh, create the flaps, then the healing will be by primary intention. So having said that, secondary intention, how do you create now a, or form what we call an epithelium line passage for the egress of tears? Okay, if you eliminate the sac, as what I've been doing in my endonasa, I remove the medial wall of the sac, and then I remove the uh, nasal mucosa. Uh, what I do uh, is I insert a, uh, what we call a, um, uh, a Griffith's collar bottom tube. I, I don't know if you are familiar with, uh, if you are doing meringotomy, or the one that is being used by uh, ENT, you know, uh, uh, if they have a pro, I mean, for their patients, a meringotomy tube, which is what we call a Griffith's collar button tube. And I straddle it uh, in the uh, area where I remove the lacrimal bone. Uh, so it's uh, more or less in the posterior lacrimal crest and then uh, straddling it. And then this uh, Griffith's collar button tube Aside from that, I also put, uh, of course, intubated with another silicone tube. So it's a double stem. And the purpose of that is after, you know, with the secondary intention, because there, there is a, uh, uh, in that uh, Griffith's collar button tube, it will not allow, you know, it will allow a formation of a niche, some sort of a niche, so that if you remove it at two months, there will be a, what we call a final healed intranasal ostium. This will prevent the migration of the nasal mucosa so that you will have a intranasal ostium. But of course, I supplement that or augment that with the mitomycin C that I also put. And this is what I've been doing also in failed DCR. I've done several cases of uh, you know, failed DCR. Uh, I do it either externally or do it endonasally. And what I do is, uh, you know, I put a mitomycin C, uh, and then of course I put a, the I straddle the uh, this uh, Griffith's collar button, so it's a double stem, and it will prevent the migration of uh, nasal mucosa, which will occlude occlude the intranasal ostium. And as after I have removed that, then uh, you already have a final healed intranasal ostium by second or third month. So that's how I manage that. It is actually a primary, a secondary intention. So I, I don't see any problem even if you are not able to create a formal mucosal flaps. I mean, uh, anastomosing your, you know, the one coming from the nasal mucosa and then one coming from the lacrimal sac. Because uh, you can have a very nice, uh, well healed, final healed intranasal ostium with that technique. That is from my experience. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, bringing the topic uh, of uh, failed DCR, uh, where uh, you have uh, asked us to manage us with the use of mitomycin C. As a young ophthalmologist, we all are bound to face the scenario where we have to face and treat the failed DCR cases. And many audiences have asked uh, on the same topic, how to manage the case of failed DCR. Can we uh, perform the failed DCR without the use of mitomycin C, especially in the scenario where mitomycin C is not easily available? Uh, trip test, I think uh, in that regard, in a case of field this year, first note that I want to put here is, I think uh, the best way to manage the field this year is because we know that uh, if the this year was done by a good experienced surgeon, uh, most of the time the failure or the problem is at the inside. So it's all around the sac area. So it's a soft tissue problem inside the sac that lead to failure of the surgery. Uh, so in that case, I always uh, say that if the endoscopic approach is available, that can give you a good solution in the sense that it will be a two-sort procedure. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to 
bother about the scar and release scar. It takes a lot of time and a lot of bleeding occurs if you do from external approach for the revision this year. In my opinion, I prefer doing it from inside because the problem is inside, not at the orbicularis, not at the scar level, at, uh, outside the sac area. So it has to be uh, probably uh, uh, addressed from the in, inside the nose. Either you use an endoscope or without an endoscope. That is one note that I want to make here. The second thing is in the field this year, uh, the paradoxical thing that uh, sometimes I, I, I tend to see a lot of field this year with good sac, intact sac, actually intact sac. Sac has not been opened, you know, and then the bones are not punched. And I started doing from inside and I realized that the bones are all intact and the sac is also intact. So in that situation, sometimes, yes, uh, doing uh, internal is equivalent to doing outside. So it takes a lot of time at that moment, but if the DCR was done by good uh, DCR surgeon, if the bone was adequately removed, then I think the internal approach is better than going from the external approach. Uh, I think more than the mitomycin, in my experience, tubing is uh, you know, life-saving in a field DCR. If you do a good scar release, if you remove all the scars and then you put a DCI tube on it, that can really save uh, your surgery, you know. That's what I believe rather than, I believe more than mitomycin, I believe the tubing in field this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm because you uh, concentric narrowing, again, of your uh, uh, intranasal ostium. That is the uh, option of your uh, mitomycin C. And as what I've said, if you have a double stent, the more it will prevent the concentric narrowing. Yeah. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, maybe Dr. Akshay Nair would like to add something on this topic. Maybe yeah, is... I mean, uh, you know, sometimes uh, 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 external DCA that has been done, you like uh, Dr. Ben said, the ostium, the bone looks okay, the sac looks okay, and you wonder what has been done. And oftentimes we, we may have come across it without realizing there is this thing called sac in sinus, which basically means that you open, you know, as you reflect the lacrimal sac and see the bone beyond the lacrimal sac while you're doing an external DCR, you make a punch, but you don't find any nasal mucosa behind that. And then you go again and you feel another bit of bone over there. So that basically is a situation where one of the anterior ethmoidal air cells is surrounding the lacrimal sac. And in that case, you need to go in a little further and open up that anterior ethmoidal air cell to encounter nasal mucosa. So sometimes as a beginner, you may feel that, oh, uh, you know, during my osteotomy, I've ended up destroying nasal mucosa because I can't find it, but you just need to be a little more brave and look for it. Also, another good clue for that is that if you've packed the nose, you should ideally see the nasal packing once you've breached the mucosa. But if you don't see nasal mucosa, think of this rare possibility of a sac in sinus where you know you have an, uh, uh, an anterior ethmoidal air cell that surrounds the lacrimal sac. Uh, not very common, but I'd say about one in 20, 25 cases. Uh, Dr. Ben, uh, Dr. Grover, sir, have you all come across this thing? Yes, sir. Uh Yes, actually, anteriorly placed ethmoidal air cells can be a problem. And um, one really has to depend on reaching the nasal mucosa. That is critical. And um, a proper anatomical orientation helps you a lot in, in having the confidence in what you are doing. If you encounter any difficulty like this because of variations, then you have to be confident. Some of the toughest cases that you do are those where there has been a naso orbito ethmoid fracture and the um, bony abnormalities are really bad. And uh, the best way of orienting in those is having passing uh, uh, an instrument from the nose into the area of the middle matrix and then making sure that you reach that area somehow or the other. It sometimes requires the use of a chisel and a hammer. The bone is so uh, profuse you need to really cut it with all your might till you get to the uh, nasal mucosa and you can feel that 
instrument from the nose. I think when in any doubt, make sure you have an instrument from the nose reaching up to the area where you made your opening. I think that is very important. And some of those points made by uh, Natabhat and uh, Dr. Havate are brilliant. Uh, when you are leaving behind a secondary intention um, with no lining, you have to be really watchful in the post-operative period. You have to be looking for signs of closure, as uh, Dr. Natabhat pointed out beautifully, at the common canaliculus or of proliferating tissue and look after that thoroughly. You need all the additional support you can, as they pointed out, with mitomycin and with intubation in these tough cases, including the traumatic case that I point that I spoke about. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, Thank you, sir. I would I say think... that uh, sac in the sinus. Uh, one minute, three please. Sac in the sinus cases we do find very frequently among the Mongolian eyes people, where the sinus is located just adjacent to the lacrimal sac, and for the beginners, that will be very confusing that once you open the lacrimal bone and reach to the sinus and you confuse that it is a nasal sinus, a nasal cavity, nasal mucosa. And you suture that it won't work because your drainage will go into the sinus instead of nasal cavity. So that's why you have to pre put some instrument through the nostril and see whether it is in front of you or not in the ostium. That will really confirm that. That's why we mostly see the People from the northern part of the Nepal, where the Mongolian people are there, see sac in the sinus. Thank, Thank you. you, Sanjay sir. Uh, sir, I would like to stay with you, Dr. Sanjay sir, for our next query. And it's also mm -hmm. very, very common scenario we face daily. And it's regarding the uh, uh, nasolacrimal duct obstruction, obstruction cases with fistula. And many audiences have asked, how to manage the fistula, fistula in DCR cases and the appropriate timing for the management of this fistula, whether we should manage early in the procedure or at the end of the surgery. I mean, at the end of the surgery. So how can we best manage the fistula in cases of uh, nasolacrimal duct uh, obstruction cases? Uh, Triptis, first of all, we have to know that what is the mechanism for the fistula? So fistula is a form in those cases where the natural pathway has blocked. So the natural drainage will seek for the another pathway, so alternative pathway, and they make the fistula around the middle part of the eyelid. That's why we have to deal with the obstructed portion of the lacrimal duct or lacrimal passage system. You have to open that. You have to canalize or you have to make the marsupialization, whatever you say that. So you clear off the blockage part of the lacrimal drainage system. And then the second part, you do the fistulectomy and close. If you close, I mean, if you do the only fistulectomy, it won't work because your fistulectomy closer will make another alternative opening because they have to get out from that pressure building inside the lacrimal drainage system. So my suggestion is first you open the block area and then do the fistulectomy. That will be appropriate. What is the experience with Dr. Havate in this? Well, uh, I have had cases of that. And you were right. I agree with you that uh, definitely it's the obstruction that you have to deal with as soon as you have dealt with. Because like, for example, if you find patients with, uh, you know, mucosil, it's just like mucosil. We're in the, you know, this uh, obstructed uh, sap is, uh, or I'm sorry, obstructed nasal lacrimal duct, uh, which can result to a dilated sac. And then finally, uh, this will create another pathway, you know? and then it will uh, result to a fistula or a mucosil. And then of course, you really have to, you, you really have to uh, recanalize at the same time, or if you don't want to recanalize, you create another pathway for the ingress of tears. And you have to really have to do a DCR, I think. Yeah, and then you can thereafter, as you've uh, said, you can uh, you know repair the fistula. Yeah, uh, quite unlike the congenital lacrimal fistula, where you have to pass a probe through the fistula and uh, dissect all around, do a micro dissection all the way up to the sac and do a closure at the sac. Um, in the acquired one, it is basically a manifestation of. Uh, an acute dacrocystitis following an obstruction. And once you are doing a dacrocystoranostomy, 
fistulas almost always heal by themselves. You are doing the additional step of excising a spindle at the fistula, primarily because that uh, tissue is necrotic, is very friable. And suturing that would be, uh, would be fraught with the risk of opening up the wound. So besides doing a routine dacrocystorhinostomy, which in any case is called for, because an acquired fistula only occurs because of uh, obstruction, followed by an acute dacrocystitis, followed by bursting and derally. You would, in any case, be doing a dacrocystorhinostomy and fistulectomy just as a spindle excision of the necrotic anterior or friable anterior tissue is usually sufficient. So in, in fistulas, I prefer to actually take the incision passing through the fistula and right. then as I dissect it, then, you know, you can excise the tract along with it. But, uh, and, and for me, if there's a fistula, I automatically switch over only to an external DCR, which is why I want to ask uh, Nata, but I know it's late uh, uh, on a Saturday night, but uh, since you prefer only endoscopic DCRs, uh, if there is a fistula, you would do, would you do an endo DCR and then a fistulectomy or what would be your plan for a mucosal with a fistula? Uh, for when you have to do a DCR? Uh, if, if the patient have the acute dacrocystitis and or uh, a rupture of the abscess and have the cutaneous fistula, I will head in to do the endoscopic DCR as soon as possible. And I, in, my, in my thought, if the, if the sac has so inflamed it and have the abscess, for the endo DCR, it's going to be very easy because of the mucosa of the sac is so inflamed and thick. And when you go in, like they have the, the you work from the first floor and the lacrimal sac on the second floor. When we approach from the uh, first floor to the second floor, we're working on the roof and it will really, it going to be really easy. To, to do and when when we open the the nasal mucosa the bone we see the medial wall of the lacrimal sac it's gonna be uh, distended and when we cut some beading and some pus coming out and then just just uh, approximation we suture and then once you drain and put the stand and the fistula will close by its own by a few weeks and and it heal nice and and sometimes to expedite the reducing of the inflammation skin, I inject uh, 10 percent of the uh, kinopod, uh, 10 milligram per cc. Inject uh, a little bit surrounding the inflamed skin and help to expedite uh, the recovery of the inflamed skin. But if you don't inject the steroid, you're gonna heal by it one also. Thanks. So there is no provision of endoscopic fistulectomy, not out. Oh, no, no need of the endoscopic fistulectomy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I, it will cause by its own. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We're almost running late for the closure of the webinar session, but I have to ask, I have to take one more question. I may not be popular by asking this question, but I have to ask this question on behalf of the audiences. We have directly message in the chat box. The question is, do we really need silicon intubation? Is it that necessary? Because, because in the presentation by uh, Dr. Ashish, we saw that in Nepal, almost 50% of the practicing ophthalmologists opted for not putting the silicon intubation during the DCR cases. So I'd like to know the opinions from our distinguished panelists. So uh, first, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Sulasmi Kotwal. Uh, please uh, uh, share your experience with us. Is plus me here? Or yes, yes. yes. Um, putting silicon tubes in my practice, uh, I usually use uh, in recurrent uh, DCR. One thing is, another is uh, in case of canalicular block uh, and uh, uh, the imp and in case of uh, young, if the patient is young, I usually use the silicon tube for three reasons. Then the uh, so, rest of the cases, uh, I'll not use it. So to answer this question, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Sulasmi, have you completed your remarks? 
Yes, you can go. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Sulasmi has beautifully highlighted uh, her indications of putting a tube in a DCI surgery. Uh, but uh, my perspective of putting a tube is different. Uh, previously, when I was doing a DCI surgery, I realized, I thought that, I conceptualized that the tube was to prevent uh, the anastomosis, you know, to collapse or anastomosis to fibrils, you know, that's what my concept was. But now my concept of putting DCI is different. So I put this the, uh, tube in this year because I don't want any retrograde blood to flow into the canaliculi during the surgery intraoperatively. And hence it uh, stays in the canaliculi and that creates a fibrosis and that fails the this year. That's my concept. So if you realize this concept of preventing the retrograde flow of the blood into the canaliculi immediately after the surgery, maybe for, within the first week of the surgery, then it seems that you have to put tube for all the patients because most of the DCR are like bloody. It bleeds and it sometimes comes, you can, you can see intraoperatively that blood coming out of the pump tongue. So that blood can stay in the canaliculi and that can actually uh, block your canaliculi and then your surgery will fail eventually. So to prevent this, it seems that you have to put tube for all the cases, uh, maybe for short time of period rather than putting it for six weeks or three months. That's what my opinion is. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Well, lastly, I'd like to take the opinion of Dr. Sayyad Mehmoob Kadir. And after that, we'll close the session. So Dr. Kadir, are you with us? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in our practice, we always put this tube in all cases because in uh, we are practicing in private hospital and the surgery cost is high. If patient, if the surgery is failed postoperatively, patient may complain uh, for uh, this year tube if we not put the this year tube. So it is better to put this year tube in private cases. But in, when I am practicing in government hospital, we are not putting in all cases, we are putting this year tube in canicular distances cases, fibrous sac cases, if a previous history of oculofacial trauma, previous history of acrodacocystitis, previous history of uh, lacrimal abscess, and uh, failed this year cases, we are putting uh, this year tube in my government hospital. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, thank you, everyone. <clears throat> With this, we conclude the panel discussion session. And I'd like to thank all the speakers and all the panelists for sharing their experiences and understanding with us uh, amid such a difficult scenario of COVID-19 pandemic. Hope we all will be able to implement the knowledge to learn <clears throat> in our daily practice. So next, we have the most awaited session for the e-magazine release, for which I would like to welcome Dr. Jyoti Baba Shrestha. She is the Associate Professor in Institute of Medicine, Maharaj Gant, and she is the current Editor-in-Chief of the e-magazine. So Dr. Jyoti Baba Shrestha, the screen is yours for sharing the release of e-magazine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Triptis. And good evening, every, everyone. First of all, I would like to congratulate the organizing committee for organizing such a wonderful webinar today. I really had a very great learning experience. Now moving on to my part. Today I am pleased to announce that we are launching the maiden issue of NASIS EMAG from this forum. And for that, I would like to request Dr. Ashish Rajpant to please share the PDF version of NASIS EMAG on the screen. Thank you so much, Ashish. And as we know that Nessus eMag is going to be a biannual bi online scientific magazine uh, of the Nepali Society for Oculoplastic Surgeon. And this eMag can be browsed from our Nessus website. Now, let me read out the editorial on behalf of my editorial team. 
The objective behind the introduction of the EMAG is to provide an ideal forum for exchange of information on oculoplasty through research papers, reviews, case studies, series, and so on. We are intending to have different themes for separate issues. In that way, the theme for this current issue is the highway of tears, which signifies the lacrimal drainage system. As we all know, the lacrimal drainage pathway disorders result in a myriad of ocular problems, ranging from persistent watering and discharge and corneal ulcer, and even may lead to blindness. Dacrocystitis, if severe and if untreated, may lead to orbitocellulitis, and its complication may lead to even loss of life. Moreover, lacrimal disorders need to be addressed prior to any intraocular surgeries to avoid site threatening infections like endophthalmitis. So these small thing disorders in the lacrimal DNA system may have serious site and life threatening consequences. Hence, this e-magazine hopes to reach the readers regarding importance and the ugly eventuality of the ostensibly nine blockage of the highway tiers. This issue is a concoction of original articles, reviews, opinions, tips and tricks, interviews, and many more that one would expect from a magazine. Articles from Dr. Milin Naik from India and Professor Hirohiko Kaki Jaki from Japan have certainly added essence to this issue. As the founder president of NASUS and our dear colleague, we have decided to have heart to heart talk with Professor Dr. Ruit Saiju, which we hope will be an interesting and insightful read to our readers. And finally, I appreciate efforts of all members of the NASUS Executive Committee, and especially Dr. Hom Bahadur Gurung and Dr. Ashish Rajpant for their untiring hard work. Our esteemed authors, without whose contribution, this issue would not have been possible. And also the web designer of the magazine, Dr. Santosh Choudhury, and his team and the sponsors for their tremendous support. I hope you will go through this magazine and give us your valuable suggestions so that we can always improve on it. Have a happy reading. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jyoti Bhavasrestha. It may be the first, but one of the most iconic and significant step for the Nepali Society for Ocular Plastic Surgeons and all the members involved. Definitely, we'll be seeing more of the e-magazine in the future. You can view and download the e-magazine from our official website, www.nesosnepal.org.np after the closing of this webinar session. Please visit the site. Thank you. Now we are uh, almost at the end of our webinar session, but before that, we have the session for the vote of thanks by Dr. Ranjana Sharma, followed by closing of the webinar session, again, once, once again, by our beloved Dr. Nisha. So I'd like to invite Dr. Ranjana Sharma for the session of vote of thanks. She is the assistant professor in Patan Academy of Health Sciences. She is the founder member and current general secretary of Nepali Society for Oculoplastic Surgeon. Dr. Ranjana Sharma, please take over the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tripti. Uh, it's been nearly four hours we are sitting here and uh, enjoying this session. Now I'll <coughs> formally uh, conclude this. Respected chair, distinguished guest speaker, national and international panelists, speakers, and all the participants, very good evening. I'm privileged to express a vote of thanks today on behalf of the entire organizing team. My heart fills with lots of gratitude and respect to our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Dr. Rinaldo M. Hawade, for not only sharing his valuable time for us to grace this occasion, but also for enlightening us with his commendable talk. Thank you so much, sir, for clearing our concept and enhancing our understanding. My heart goes out to thank our respected international and national panelists for accepting our invitation, participating in this webinar by encouraging the moral of speakers and adding your valuable comments on their topics. Without your kind presence, we could not have accomplished what we had dreamed for. Next, I would like to thank all the speakers for sharing your knowledge and fact on dacryology. We all really enjoyed and were enlightened by your talks. 
It was the dedication and enthusiasm of our organizing chairperson, Dr. Ben Limbu, our immediate past president, Dr. Basantara Sharma, their constant support and guidance and all the uh, support of all the executive team members made this event a huge success. Thank you all. Conducting this webinar would have been impossible without the jealous effort of Dr. Priyana Oryal, scientific chair, and Dr. Asis Raj Pant, scientific secretary, who worked continuously devoting their business time and dedication. They are the main backbone of this event, and I have heartfelt gratitude towards them. I would like to thank co-organizer Biratnagar Eye Hospital for sponsoring today's webinar, and also the IT team for technical support. My special thanks to Dr. Nisa Sresta, Dr. Sabin Sahu, Dr. Dripis Raj Pandey, our young dynamic oculoplastic surgeons, moderators of today's webinar. Congratulations to all of you for this smooth and lively presentation. I am thankful to executive members of NASOS, editorial committee of EMAC, for being successful in publishing its first issue today. Special thanks to Dr. Hom Badir Gurung and Asis Raj Pant, who worked day and night to publish this EMAC. Congratulations for, for this work. Last but not the least, I'd like to thank all the participants and all the members of NASOS, members of NOS, for being patient and contributing your time for listening and actively participating in today's webinar. We are very happy to announce our website, which was dormant for last few months, www.nesosnepal.org.lp, which was updated, updated today. I'd like to thank Dr. Hom Gurung and our IT person, Samin Maharjan, for this. Now you can browse our website and see the latest news and events. Thank you all. Good night. Now to moderators. Thank you, Dr. Anjana, and thank you everyone for the wonderful sessions today. We have had a very good number of Zoom participants and YouTube viewers today, and uh, this has been a great opportunity to learn about different forms of DCR and canadicular trauma from our distinguished speakers and panelists. We also have had opportunity to witness the launch of the NSS uh, e-magazine. And like me, we hope uh, you all have gained something new from this webinar. Before we end this program, I would like to request our organizing community, panelists and speakers to keep the video on for a group photograph for a memorandum of this program. As Dr. Tripler said earlier, let's not forget to put on the best smile. Thank you. Thank you. I think I think the short is short is over. Is that screen short over, uh, Dr. Nisa? Can we stop smiling? I did not get all so, the pictures uh, so, in one frame. Somji, can you can you confirm? Yes. Uh, so, Somji, please confirm. <laughs> Make sure that everyone has a big smile. Yes. Hello, Somji, are you there? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Somji. That would be a record for the longest smile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At the back side, sir, I would like to... At the back side, I'd like to read, uh, thank you, uh, Professor A.K. Grover, sir, uh, who is uh, really... Uh, Professor of Professor. Some of the people call he as a Professor of Professor. So uh, it's, it was a pleasure to have you here, sir. Uh, and uh, we are really glad that you are here, sir. Similarly, uh, Professor Mawate, uh, founder of Asia Pacific uh, Society, and also is a tycoon in Asia Pacific. Uh, so thank you, sir, for being with us. And then similarly, uh, Dr. Natawood, who is a real endoscopic uh, this year, I, I should say he's a pointer in, uh, in, in, again, Asia Pacific and also in the global market. So 
global arena. So I, I, I must uh, thank him for being with us here. And similarly, uh, my friend Akshay Nair from uh, Mumbai, who was uh, really a kind of uh, tycoon for managing uh, COVID during uh, the COVID pandemic and nuclear mycosis. Uh, thank you, Akshay, for uh, coming and then joining our company. And also, uh, Dr. Said Mehbub, uh, who is a good friend of mine from all the way from Bangladesh. Uh, thank you for joining with us and then sharing your skills and the knowledge and empowering our uh, Nepalese uh, eye specialist and also plastic surgeons about uh, different lacrimal disorders today. I really thank you all. And then I think uh, with this, we conclude our uh, webinar for today. And then uh, good evening and good night for today. And then we'll see again, uh, back to back again, maybe in some of the physical meeting or some of the other webinar in future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, sir. Thank you. Good, good night, night everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Be safe. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Dr. Howate. Good night. 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 <laughs> there was no interruption in between. It went so smoothly, so nicely, and the uh, ah. uh, the this audio part was so clear. No interruption in between, and video was so ah. clear for four hours. So it was so great. Mm. Eh? Congratulations, yes. especially for IT team, eh? Congratulations mm. and thank so you. So team, IT. Congratulations so and thank you. And uh, thank you, Doctor. Abu Bonda Garo. Okay, fine. Uh, on the okay, good night. Stay safe, everyone. Good night. 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 Good night